Alrighty, good morning. Good morning. Is it, a, is it morning? No, it's afternoon. Sorry, it's a long weekend. Welcome. I am Councilmember Donovan Richards from the 31st District in Queens, and I'm the Chair of the Public Safety Committee. I want to acknowledge the Council Members who are here. I want to start with uh, Councilmember Carlos Menchaca, uh, Councilmember Gibson, and our newest addition from Southeast Queens, uh, Councilwoman Adrienne Adams. Welcome. We only have one. Oh, wait, we have to initiate her. Uh, that was a joke. Okay. We're going to now, uh, and then we're also joined by Councilmember Reynoso as well. Uh, we are here today to learn from the department about their role out of two laws that were collectively known as the Right to Know Act, Local Law 54 of 2017 and Local Law 56 of 2017. Together, these laws curtailed the ability of police officers from engaging in one of the worst stop and frisk tactics. When officers would stop someone for, for no good reason and with no explanation, but sometimes with force go through their pockets, it is pretty much only, uh, it pretty much only happened in communities of color, and it happened a lot, hundreds of thousands of times every year. And it is suggested that the department viewed those hundreds of thousands of hardworking folks, students, parents, and children as nothing more than potential criminals instead of citizens who have a constitutional right to be free from unlawful searches. One of the laws we passed required the department to train its officers to obtain voluntary consent any time it wanted to conduct a search. The other law requires officers during any stop where the officer suspects criminal activity but does not have probable cause to arrest, must provide an explanation for why the person was stopped and present the, and present the person with a business card that tells the person who the officer is and how to complain about the stop. Now, I actually voted against the second bill. I fully support the goals of the bill, but I felt it did not go far enough. I think officers should provide business cards almost every time they initiate an interaction with a civilian, including level one stops and traffic stops. Stops. When a police officer asks someone for their name, that's technically a level one stop, but it can be intimidating, especially given our history. Officers make traffic stops in communities of color much more often than everywhere else, and we need the same protections in place to make sure traffic stops aren't just another version of stop and frisk. And that's a personal experience of mine. My goal is simple. I want to make sure that officers have an incentive to treat everyone they come across with respect without exceptions. Regardless, we are going to hear about what steps the department has taken to implement these laws. We want to make sure that the department has procedures in place in place for making sure that officers are complying with the law when conducting these stops. And given that the federal monitor and the Floyd litigation is concerned about underreporting, we want to make sure that the searches that take place are not being underreported. In addition, we want to make sure that the way in which officers are asking for consent actually makes a person feel like it is voluntary. So we are also going to hear from the Civilian Complaint Review Board to find out in this early stage of the law's implementation if the CCRB is receiving complaints that the law is not being followed or if in the course of their investigations of other cases they are seeing evidence that it is not being followed. We are also hearing two bills today, introduction number 1522, sponsored by Councilmember Gibson, which would require the CCRB to report information regarding complaints about violations of the Right to Know Act. We are also hearing pre-considered introductions sponsored by Councilmember Torres, which would, re wait, Renoso, not Torres, which would require the NYPD, that was a blooper on my, on my statement, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, which would require the, it's really Monday morning, Monday afternoon, <laughs> uh, which would require the NYPD to report on requests to consent to search that were denied. Before we begin, I just want to say that our goal here is not to cast blame. It is to get this role out right. I know that changing the way 35,000 police officers conduct one of their core functions is not easy, and I know that there are logistical challenges to overseeing this implementation. 
but getting this right is so crucial for the communities that still vividly remember the way we were treated for so long and just as crucial for the department as it continues to improve its image as one of one that protects all New Yorkers. Since I believe we share the same goals, let's figure out how we can work together on this. And I'd like to thank, uh, before we turn to my colleagues uh, for their statements, I'd like to thank Committee Counsel Daniel Adis, uh, Policy Analyst Casey Addison, and my Legislative Director Jordan Gibbons for all of their hard work on this hearing. And with that being said, we will go first to uh, Council Member Gibson. Uh, because she has to head to another committee. Then we hear from Reynoso. We also are joined by council members Lansman and Cohen as well. And also, thank you. Thank oh, and you. also our public advocate Jamani Williams. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chair Donovan Richards. Good afternoon to everyone who's here, to all of my colleagues on the Public Safety Committee. I also want to welcome Councilmember Adrian Adams to the committee. Looking forward to our collective work together. Uh, I am Councilmember Vanessa Gibson of District 16 in the Bronx, and I'm thankful to Chair Richards for holding this hearing today to talk about two important bills that are carried by myself and Councilmember Antonio Reynoso. Um, I am proud to introduce and prime sponsor Intro 1522, which will require the Civilian Complaint Review Board, CCRB, to report uh, information regarding complaints that officers have failed to properly identify themselves or failed to obtain knowing and voluntary consent prior to conducting a search. Um, in addition, this bill on today's agenda will require the CCRB to report information regarding complaints about violations of Administrative Code Sections 14-173 and 14-174, which are collectively collectively known as the Right to Know Act. Um, and I want to thank our speaker, Corey Johnson, and certainly chair of the Public Safety Committee, Donovan Richards and Casey Addison and Daniel uh, Ades and the committee team for their work. Um, I was here during the last term in 2017. I chaired the Public Safety Committee when this city council voted um, on the Right to Know Act. And I remember the long journey, a lot of advocacy, a lot of input, a lot of analysis of what we could do as a city as an administration to ensure that New Yorkers understood their rights, their rights were affirmed by law, and we also wanted to make sure that we continue to engage with law enforcement and police officers in their uh, conduct of searches were able to provide this very critical information. And here we are uh, over a year later of the implementation of the Right to Know Act, and these bills that were put forth are simply a way to understand what is happening, understand any of the gaps in service any deficiencies that we have identified as a department, both the NYPD as well as the CCRB. And for those of us that work with the CCRB and host monthly office hours in our district offices, we also want to make sure uh, that CCRB continues to do outreach and share information. Um, I remember when the Right to Know Act was passed and codified in law, CCRB's outreach team went to all of the boroughs, um, including mine in the Bronx, and did outreach at a number of uh, different outdoor events and family days and different recreation events um, to share information because a lot of times the laws that we enact here that are signed by the mayor does not always translate on the ground. And simply put, we have to do better as a council, we have to do better as an administration to make sure that New Yorkers understand their fundamental and civil rights. And so I'm grateful to host and be a part of today's hearing today because we really want to hear from the department, from the administration on how it has been going in terms of implementation, as well as any improvements that we could identify and work towards. And today's introduction of these bills on the agenda is to do just that. So once again, I want to thank uh, my colleagues in government looking forward to today's hearing as well as moving forward and do apologize in advance that I have to step out. Uh, the challenge of sitting on seven committees. Uh, there is another uh, dual committee that's taking place right now uh, that I will be going to shortly. So I thank you again for being here to the NYPD and CCRB and to all the staff as well as thank you to Chair Donovan Richards once again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Reynoso, we'll go to you. I just uh, want to thank uh, the committee for hearing uh, this in important follow-up to the Right to Know Act. It was a law that took many years uh, to pass in my time, uh, four years, but even before that as part of uh, the CRA um, where uh, 
Council Member, then Council Member Jermani Williams, now Public Advocate, helped pass it. I also want to thank CCRB um, for the work they did in making sure that the general public knew about the important uh, changes that were being made uh, related to uh, the Right to Know Act. Uh, uh, we are going to hear today from members of the public um, that have had interactions with officers um, that seem to speak to non-compliance with the law. Uh, that concerns me uh, because of the fight we had and the intent and the good faith efforts that we were supposed to build through negotiations of this law um, would have made it so that we take it seriously. But right now it doesn't seem like uh, there's a culture change within the department uh, that is implementing this in a serious way. Uh, it's either that, or uh, they all run out of. They've either all ran out of cards, or we've significantly reduced the amount of consent searches that happen in the department. Um, so today we're going to find out uh, a lot of information because there is new data, uh, and I'm excited to hear that. But I think my goal in this hearing is for the NYPD to hear what we have to say and begin the process of taking the right to know act seriously. And I know we have growing pains that we have to go through. But my biggest concern is that while those growing pains are happening, people's rights are being affected or people's rights are not being uh, respected. And uh, we don't have time to have progress on justice. Justice, justice should always happen now. Uh, so thank you again, the chair, for giving me time. And I'm looking forward to your testimony and to some questions. We'll go to public advocate Jamani Williams now. Stephen. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Council Member Gibson, of course, Council Member Reynoso for his leadership and, and the speaker. Um, I, I am here just to want to uh, be a part of the conversation. Uh, I think any time these bills uh, uh, get pushed or questions of how to make policing better, there's always going to be a natural tension that exists. I don't know if that is uh, ever going to go away, uh, but it is important to keep these conversations going forward. I always say that these conversations can never stop. But sometimes it seems as uh, after there's one big fight, everybody thinks that the conversation is going to end, and if it gets pushed, that it's being excessive. Uh, I don't think it is. I think we have to continue uh, these conversations. I know there was a, a bit of resistance, whether it was the Community Safety Act or the Right to Know Act, uh, on behalf of the police department. I am happy that uh, we have a, a police department that I think, uh, I know actually, uh, is looking at these things uh, differently than the previous the police department, and so that I appreciate. Uh, but there are still some uh, natural tensions. Uh, I do think there's still resistance resistance uh, to the uh, spirit and the letter of the law when it comes to right to no act. So I'm looking forward to uh, hear uh, what your testimony is. Unfortunately, I won't be able to stay as long either, but I am uh, paying attention uh, to make sure that what the council enacts uh, is actually putting being put into practice. Thank you. Thank you, public advocate. We'll now go to the, our first panel, uh, NYPD, Oleg. Deputy Chief Josh Gosgrove, Managing Attorney Michael Clark, and Director Alexander Cron. All righty, with that being said, you want to swear them in? And then you may begin. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and answer all questions to the best of your ability before this committee? Yes. 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 <clears throat> Good morning. Good afternoon, Chair Richards and members of the Council. and. Public Advocate Williams. Uh, I am Oleg Tranovsky, the Department's Executive Director of Legislative Affairs, and I'm joined here by Deputy Chief John Cosgrove from the NYPD's Risk Management Bureau, Alex Crone from the Office of Chief of Strategic Initiatives, and Michael Clark, the Managing Attorney of Legislative Affairs for the Department. On behalf of Police Commissioner James P. O'Neill, we're pleased to testify about the implement implementation of the Right to Know Act. Building trust between the NYPD and the city's diverse communities has been a cornerstone of the commissioner's mission. The implementation of neighborhood policing has transformed the way we do business and has allowed the department to continue to drive down crime while bringing us closer to those we serve. Notably, arrests are down from 387,805 in 2014, the first year of Mayor de Blasio's term, to 246,773 last year. That is a 36, almost a 36.5% drop. <clears throat> Likewise, criminal court summonses have, have dropped from almost 360,000 in 2014 to just under 90,000 last year, a 75% drop. 
the department has reduced the number of times it stopped citizens from a high mark of 685,724 in 2011 to 11,008 in 2018, a decrease of 98.3%. These, these decreases are emblematic of a department ethos to work smarter, to focus our resources with a laser-like precision on persistent pockets of violence and the few that are responsible for it and to empower our officers to exercise their judgment and problem solve in ways that do not necessarily need to end with some sort of enforcement. Many people said this decrease in enforcement would lead to a corresponding increase in crime. The mayor, this department, council members, and many advocates challenged that common thinking, and under the leadership of Commissioners Bratton and O'Neill, we have been proven correct. The decreased enforcement has not led to an increase in crime. The only thing that has increased is the trust between the police and those that live in, work in, and visit our city as we have moved beyond the corrosive divide created during the height of stop and frisk era. Crime continues to decline to historic lows with the city recording fewer than 300 murders and 900 shootings for two consecutive years, numbers that would have been unfathomable in previous administrations. However, there is still more work to do, and as Commissioner O'Neill has stated time and time again, there are things the NYPD is good at, things that we are the best at, but we can always be better. After the passage of Local Laws 54 and 56 of 2018, the Department immediately set, out, set up a working group and began the work of ensuring that we were able to timely implement these laws. In the nine months that were allotted, we needed to revise procedures, create new forms to collect data, design, mass produce, and distribute business cards to tens of thousands of uniformed members of the service, and figure out a way to ensure officers knew what, what was required of them. The department immediately began leveraging existing training to help spread the word. In January of last year, the department was in, early, in the early stage of a the early stages of training each and every uniformed officer on investigative encounters. After receiving comments from the Federal Monitor and the plaintiffs in the Davis, Ligon, and Floyd litigation, the in-service investigative encounter training was updated to teach officers about the impending changes to the law and department procedure. These updates were also included in training and recruit and that recruits in the academy, new plainclothes officers, and newly promoted sergeants and lieutenants must attend. The next step was figuring out what we didn't know. We were, sure, we were unsure how often officers would be required to give out ca cards and how often they would choose to give out cards, even when it isn't required. So we instituted a 30-day pilot program in four precincts to ensure there would be no surprises once, implement, once we implemented department-wide. We followed, we followed this up with uh, two focus groups, one with supervisors and one with officers. The pilot and focus groups gave us much needed insight into what a full rollout will look like and showed us that training we thought we were going to use was insufficient. We immediately embarked on improving the training provided to officers so that they were clear about when they were required to offer contact cards. Realizing that not all officers would be able to complete the in-person training prior to the law becoming effective, we created a three-pronged training approach for our officers. The first part of the training was the creation of, of two videos that officers were required to view. In order to get credit for viewing the videos, they were required to pass two quizzes demonstrating proficiency in the subjects covered in the videos. Additionally, training sergeants from across the department were trained at the police academy with respect to our obligations under the new laws. As, as is the case with any change in law or policy, the training sergeants are then required to perform command level training for all officers in their command during roll call. The third prong to this approach is reinforcement through ongoing training. We achieved this prong by inserting right to know training into existing curriculums such as recruit training, promotional training for sergeants and lieutenants, plain clothes training, and in-service training in an effort to help ensure compliance in years to come. 
Additionally, in order to ensure officers had a simple way of understanding their legal obligations in various contexts, the department created an easy-to-use memo book insert that described the various types of encounters and what they were required to do in each of these situations. The working group also had to coordinate design, printing, and distribution of the contact cards. The working group, the working group completed many markups that, were ultimate, that would ultimately contain the necessary information and would look presentable and professional. Once settled, the department printed and distributed the cards. In the end, the department printed a little more than 9.3 million personalized cards and an additional 934,000 blank cards, totaling 10.2 million cards. By October 18th of last year, we had completed distribution. In addition, we had to devise a system that enabled us to easily replenish contact cards when officers ran out. In order to address this scenario, we created a portal on the department's intranet which allowed officers to replenish their card stock with the click of a button. The aim of simplifying this process was to reduce instances where officers do not have personalized cards. The new business card requirement overlapped with requirements under the, under the Davis-Floyd Lagan litigation. Specifically, officers were required to hand over the what is a stop tear-off, which provided basic information about stops in general and checkboxes that detailed the reasons behind the stop in particular. The department felt it would be more efficient to hand over a single item to citizens and worked with plaintiffs and the federal monitor to replace the tear-off. In its place, the department created a website and printed the URL on the back of the contact card. The website provides much of the information that was provided on the tear-off. In addition, the plaintiffs and federal monitor agreed to replace the checkboxes so long as we were able to create an expedited process to allow individuals to obtain their own stop report. As a result, individuals can now make this request online via a link on the website or in person. To date, there have been 65 expedited requests for stop reports, all of which were provided from between one to seven days of the request. This system is a significant improvement over the tear-off. The tear-off provided very limited information to individuals about why they were stopped. The stop report, on the other hand, is designed to provide significantly more detail, including a narrative, a narrative section which can provide individuals with greater clarity for the reasons behind the encounter. The website also includes links for individuals to request body-worn camera footage and to make a complaint to CCRB or IAB about any police misconduct. Finally, we needed to begin to collect data to be in compliance with the new laws. With permission of the federal monitor and the plaintiffs in the Floyd Lagan Davis litigation, we edited the stop report so that officers would be required to indicate whether they asked an individual for consent to search and whether that consent was granted. In addition, we created a new report to, to capture the required data when officers ask for consent to search an individual when it is not in the context of a Terry stop. There, have been, there has been criticism in some circles about the manner in which we implemented this rollout. As with all new initiatives, after our initial implementation, there will, be, there will come a point where we reassess and make necessary changes. We are in the process of doing that now, and there, will, and there were several comments from community advocacy groups that make sense and will be included in future revisions. For example, we will more prominently highlight the need to follow our translation guidelines when seeking consent to search an individual with limited English proficiency and will change the name and the instructions on the consent to search report in order to ensure that officers know that the procedures must be followed when searching a vehicle or home. I will now briefly comment on one of the pieces of legisla legislation being heard today. Preconsidered, in preconsidered intro 4052 would require the department to report on the number of times a person refused consent based on the request by officers to search. We are currently collecting and posting the information that is envisioned in this proposed bill based on an agreement to do so with the original bill sponsor, and therefore we do not oppose this bill. Thank you, and we look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, uh, Oleg. Um, all right, let me start with, uh, and then I'll, Vanessa, you have questions too? 
Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure you had enough time. Uh, do you know how many cards have been distributed since uh, Right to Know was implemented? We had distributed um, all, I, in all, we printed 10.2 uh, million. We distributed okay. all of them. Now, every command was giving an allotment, given an allotment of uh, blank cards. Okay. So in case an officer runs out and they didn't use the intranet portal to replenish their stock, it's at, every, uh, it's at the command desk so they can get a, um, a quantity of blank cards, write their names in, and go out on patrol. No, uh, I think it's nine point three million or something. I think it was nine point three million of the personalized printed cards and about nine hundred and thirty five thousand of the blank cards. Right, and the personal cards were distributed to, right. to the police officer. And who keeps track uh, of ensuring that officers are replenishing when they run out? Who who does a, who would do oversight over that, or is that just specifically the officers? Well, I think it's a combination of things. There, the it's specifically, obviously, specifically the officer. If an officer is going out on patrol without the necessary tools, and based on the local laws, these are necessary tools to carry with you when you're out on patrol. So, if you're going out without the necessary tools, that's in violation of the department protocol. If you're not providing the cards as required by the law and in turn required by department policy, then that would be a violation of the policy as well. So uh, th that's- But right the now, who specifically, when they do roll call, is someone asking, you got your cards, you have your cards. What I'm getting at is, you know, because then you, you have the blank cards and the blank cards, they would have to fill in their specific names, I'm assuming? Correct. And all of their information, which, not saying it's being done, but we want to make sure that if we pass a law that officers are adhering to it. How many officers have run out of cards? Um, so since uh, as of March 15th, so these numbers are a little out of date, uh, we've had 1,800 requests for additional cards. 1,800 requests right. from, eight, from 1,800 officers? That's correct. Okay, got it. It's possible someone asked twice, but yes. Okay. And you're tracking if they've asked twice. And how do we know they're actually giving the cards out to the public? So not, as Oleg mentioned, that them, uh, there's a lot of somewhere. different ways that you do that. But you okay. know, to answer your roll call question, oftentimes the training sergeants, you know, okay. will during roll call say, hey, you know, do you have your cards? It'll be, you know, every precinct is a little bit different, but that is done uh, on a routine basis uh, in, the, in the precincts. And can you just go through what does the business card say in terms of how people can address complaints about police misconduct? Sure, we and go we through also a, uh, language as well, because I know that was something the advocate spoke of as well, language access. We have a, we have a markup of, of the contact card, a blow up that we can distribute to you. The front of the card obviously has the required officer name, um, shield, um, a blank for the precinct uh, on the card. Uh, Right, um, name, shield, command, and um, and there's also uh, the blank for command that you can fill in the command number in the event an officer is transferred. We, we're not constantly printing cards. You can fill that part in and makes it a little more of an efficient process. The back of the card has uh, information on uh, calling 311 if you have comments about the encounter, and it also has a website link to request your body-worn camera footage, and this kind of tracks this is a way we integrated both bills. So uh, um, Council Member Reynoso's bill required that we offer individuals information on how to request uh, body-worn camera footage of their consent stop. Um, we felt the best way to do that is to actually put the URL on the back of a contact card because one of the required instances where an officer must give out a contact card is after a consent search has been completed. So by doing that, we're actually providing the individual uh, subject to the consent search with the officer's name, rank, shield number, uh, precinct, and we're also giving them information on where they can call to comment on the stop and the website they can visit to request uh, the body-worn camera footage. And, and the website also has information on how to file a complaint with CCRB and IAB. All right. Uh, and how many... Um, wanted to go through, do you know how many stops were conducted that required a business card to be handed out? So, I mean, we, the fourth quarter of, um, fourth quarter 2018, we had uh, 419 uh, consent search, 
request, uh, request the consent to search. Out of that 419, 368 people granted uh, consent to search. And that's, our, that's the fourth quarter report that we posted on our website pursuant to the law. And just go through a scenario when somebody voluntarily uh, is searched, gives consent to search. So just go through, can you go through a, a scenario where you're in the street, an officer is in the street, what would that look like? What would that interaction look like? And, and so I what just want to make what, sure I understand the yeah, question. Just go through a scenario, an, an officer sees a gentleman on the street and requests consent to search. Right. Well, I mean, it, it's that would not be a scenario where we would request to search. Just merely seeing somebody in the street and saying, I want no, to No, 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 I'm just saying, but, but I think voluntary. So you said right. there were 368 instances where people voluntarily gave you consent to search. Mm -hmm. So these individuals, how would an officer, officer approach an individual in this instance and request to volunteer. So, I mean, it can come in the context of a, I think the mo more, most common would be a reasonable suspicion stop, commonly known as a, a level three stop, where you have reasonable suspicion that a crime has been committed, is about to be committed. Um, there is a level three stop. Uh, maybe the individual is, the information is uh, that there is a gun, uh, individual with a gun. We see an individual fitting that description. Um, carrying a bag and at that during that stop uh, we would ask for consent to look into the bag. And most people you've just found to just voluntarily consent? No, I mean cases. I think it's uh, I think out of 419 requests there were unless my math is off 51 that individuals that denied consent so pursuant to uh, the council members bill uh, council member Reynoso's bill we were to we were obligated to provide uh, um, guidance to our officers and train them on how to, obta how to obtain knowing voluntary and intelligent consent from individuals that we encounter. And we did that through the variety of training that we did, whether it be, um, we did NYPDU, which is our int intranet-based training, where we put quizzes on the back of the, of, the, um, of the video. We did that through roll call training by training our training sergeants and then having the training sergeants train. And then we recognized that we need this to happen on an ongoing basis and I think uh, the public advocate had mentioned you know we don't want to be put in a situation where you know we negotiate something now the negotiations over everybody moves on and and okay we close the chapter what we recognize is the seriousness of these uh, of, of these laws that were passed and what we try to do is embed the training not only in this uh, one-time upfront training to get us into compliance with the law but into ongoing training so we put it into recruit training in the academy so every recruit coming out is going to be trained on this when an officer gets a plain clothes assignment uh, they're going to be trained on this as part of plain clothes training when uh, supervisors become supervisors and get promoted, uh, we train them uh, during their mandatory training on how to be a sergeant, how to be a lieutenant. And we did it as part of the in-service training as well, uh, the street encounter training. Yeah, and um, so you, you answered the consent question, but how many stops in particular were conducted that required a business card to be handed out? So, I mean, do we have level two? So you're asking for Amongst level two, so your level three stop. How many required a business card? Or two. So, I mean, we had eleven thousand stops 11, in 2018. 000. So, you know, obviously, it only, the law only begins in October of 19th. So it's some portion of that, and I don't know what the numbers are yet for to date for this year. Um, but except unless we give an arrest or summons, it should be all of them getting a, a business card afterwards. I, but I don't have the, the exact data on that. Do we track level twos? We don't track right. level twos. Right, we don't track level twos, so we don't know that. But for level threes, which we do track, it's unless it ended in an arrest or a summons, I believe, is the, the exception. Everyone should have gotten one and, after and a, a level three stop. And how many, how often did a uh, level three stop uh, encounter end up in an arrest? And can you, do you have more of a breakdown of the outcome of those, of the stops? You said 11,000 stops? Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, we don't have that, but it's certainly something we could provide after the hearing. That, that's a number we can get for you.
How many searches of persons or property, including vehicles? That would be the 419 uh, requests and 368 um, actual searches. 368 for, actual. Uh, from October 19th through December 31st of last year. Right. And go through roadblocks or checkpoints. Do you have the information disseminated down to that? Can you disseminate the information down? Well, that's, it's not disaggregated out that way. It's, it's grouped together. So we have. We would love for it to be. Well, right. I mean, I yeah. think when we passed the laws, we captured, we were obligated to report a certain amount of data. I can look into those buckets. I'm not saying that it's impossible. Uh, I can look into it. I didn't know that that was something that, that you wanted to drill down on, but we can certainly look at the buckets and see if we could capture the buckets. But just just to be clear that the 419 requests, 368 acceptance was based on the the seven buckets that were outlined in the law. And right? what so I'm getting back at, and how do we know officers are actually um, letting people know they have the right to not consent to a search? So are we positive now body camera footage has to be turned on uh, correct yes before absolutely. any search uh who reviews that body footage our risk body management bureau footage. how often is reviews it? it i mean we do it as part of the um federal monitorship what we do is we re we review the body worn camera footage as a part of that uh, monitorship and what we've done is integrated the review and integrated the requirements under the law into that process as well but again, I mean, I think it's it's important to to highlight, and I just I, I guess we should do it at the outset, is we're very early in the rollout, so we have a the for the only quarterly report that's out there now is a partial quarter of 2018. Again, the bill took effect on October 19th of 2018, so it doesn't even capture a full quarter. We would need to get a little further in take a look at a few quarters, compare the quarters against each other to see if there's any kind of trends or patterns. These laws were a big deal. They were a big change. And, you know, we, as you've said early on in, in your testimony, we're the, we're the largest department in the country. We have 36,000 officers. Getting the message out on something this big is something we took very seriously to Council Member Reynoso's point. When we when, when this law was passed and we negotiated in good faith, what we decided to do, even though this wasn't mandated in the law, is we created a pilot because we realized these were significant changes to, to traditional protocols that we did. So we rolled out a uh, pilot program in four precincts, which wasn't required by the law. We did that on our own initiative. After that, we did focus groups, both with the police officers and their supervisors. And we did that before the full rollout of the law. We wanted to know if we're seeing problems, we wanted to catch it early and try to amend training. And what we did was we actually saw that there were issues. Officers weren't understanding what their responsibilities were, so what we did was augmented the training. We created the NYPDU videos. Initially, I think the thought process was that we were going to train the training sergeants and the training sergeants were going to train the officers at roll call. We realized that maybe wasn't enough. And we created, based on the pilot and the focus groups, we did the NYPDU training. We still stuck with the in-service training as reinforcement. And then we added as further reinforcement on uh, uh, th this program into ongoing training. And uh, can we see the videos is there yeah, we, okay sure. all righty let me ask you a question in what manner are officers because this is the big question uh for those and have you found cases uh where officers have not uh done what the intent of these laws uh were passed uh, to do i think it's uh, again i think it's pretty early to say. I, I know you're going to have CCRB on after us, and maybe they can shed some more light, because clearly uh, one of the requirements in the bill and one, one of the things that we put on the card is 
uh, 311 to make complaints. 311 would route them to CCRB. We also, in our portal, even though it's not on the back of the card, we give CCRB's phone number when you enter the portal to make complaints, which I know was a topic that folks wanted to be on the card itself, but we found that to be a compromise as well by, we put 311 on the card, but we put CCRB's number on the portal. So maybe they'll shed some light uh, as to what they've seen in the first couple of months. Right, and it's relatively early, so the data may not not reflect and how many 311 complaints are you aware of any I'm of them? not I'm not you don't track that well we're, we don't run 311 okay. but, but you, I, do you I get mean, that data again, I question. think I think the right answer to this is you're having mm -hmm. CCRB come here next uh, mm -hmm. 311 would just forward the call to CCRB so rather than tracking how many calls went into 311 all they do is funnel it towards CCRB and they'd be able to give well, it. I'm appreciative of your love for the CCRB mm -hmm. on this but I am interested in knowing, do you track <laughs> the complaints as well? I, I get CCRB has a fund. No, I, I understand. But I mean. But would the police department be interested in this data as well? We, of course we're interested right. in it. And I, and I think that goes to my earlier point that we're so early in the process that CCRB, I'm sure, can give you their numbers. I don't know what they are. But I don't know what how many of those numbers have been substantiated. Um, They'll right. be able to share that. Obviously, I get that. We're, we're interested but in those numbers. I know numbers. it's early, but we want to make sure that officers get it right early of as course. well, right? Because it's like, you know, equivalent to doing potty training, right? You got to keep going and going and try to, I'm going through this phase now. You're trying to, trying to get it right. We're working. Um, well, I don't know if I, <laughs> I don't know if I'd like it to potty training, I, I would say but, that. I, I mean, but, I, think, I think the important but we, part is mm -hmm. that we do recognize what you're saying and what the council member said earlier in, the, in his opening remarks. The pilot program that we did was self-initiated. We weren't forced to do Get it. Get that. And no, but, but I think that speaks okay. to your question about mm -hmm. how seriously we're taking it and do okay. we really care if officers get it right. If we didn't care if officers got it right, we can put out a finest message and, and not do any follow-up. We, we actually took a, diff a variety of steps to ensure that they got it right at the outset. But again, we're a partial quarter in. We need to see a few quarters to see if there's any patterns, any trends, if we see any kind of systemic issues that we need to remediate through training. So this is, the pilot started when? The pilot was before the rollout. Before the rollout. So was, in, the, in October, this went into effect. October 19th. So yeah. you're telling me you can't find trends from October to now? No, I think no, and I don't think There's that's no I don't think that's a controversial thing to say. I mm -hmm. uh, you have a very big program being rolled out department wide to thirty six thousand officers. <laughs> this is something new, something they're not used to, and I think it takes time to roll it out. Now we did our due diligence up front to make sure that they're well versed in it. You know, for for the go date for day one. And now we need to study those numbers as they come in. And there certainly aren't sufficient amount of numbers in yet. OK, I'm going to come back uh, for more questions. The, the last question that I have before I come back is, what happens if an officer does not comply with the law? What is the, what is the discipline that they could face? I think it's, it's like any other uh, violation of the patrol guide, right? So the law was codified. Uh, the law, the law was codified into our patrol guide and it became department policy. Any violation of department policy, we would have to take a look to see what the severity is. Is it an, was it an innocent mistake that an officer just got the requirement wrong? Something that could be remediated through training. Was it something that was willfully done? Something to be remediated by a, a, a more severe type of discipline? I mean, I think all of the options are on the table, and we look at it on a case-by-case basis as any violation of the patrol guide. I will come back. Um, we are joined by Powers, Deutsch, and Cabrera, and I will go to first uh, Councilmember Reynoso, followed by Adams, and then we'll go to uh, Public Advocate um, uh, Jamani Williams. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so I just have a, a couple of questions. In from uh, uh, its implementation, October to December, how many uh, level three stops happened? Um, I guess that's what I'm asking. Did we break it out October to December? I mean, we have um, 
do we break it out quarterly on our website? I don't know. We do it annually on our website. Yeah, we do. We do. We do it annually. It's something I can absolutely get for you. We we have eleven thousand and eight uh, level three stops in calendar year twenty eighteen. All right. So in twenty eighteen, so, let's say eleven thousand. Eleven thousand and eight. Level okay. three stops, of which from October to December, three month period. Um, I'll I'll get you the exact number. I don't want to guess, but. I yeah, mean, but if I, you want to crudely divide it by four and get a guesstimate, maybe. Yeah, that, I'm gonna, that, I, that is what I'm going to do. So I'm, I'm going to do about 2,500 stops in that time. Um, and those require business cards. Outside of that, level ones and twos don't re require a business card. Uh, level two does. Level, level two does, but they don't need to report it. And level two stops are a lot more common than level three stops. So, so level twos, right, level twos aren't reported through a formal mechanism the way level three is. Okay, and level and are level two significantly? Uh, how many level two stops ex um, have happened in the previous year? Again, that's that's. If it's eleven thousand level threes, you gotta have the number for level twos. No, I mean that's that's not something that's tracked. Terry stops have been routinely tracked. Terry stops or level three stops have been routinely okay. uh, tracked. Again, there's an elevation of suspicion as you go up the levels. Um, you know, okay. so level threes have always been the ones tracked. Obviously, level fours, which are enforcement, whether summons of arre or arrest, mm -hmm. that's tracked because we have those how, numbers. How many how many business cards do each officer does each officer get? Uh, regular patrol officers get two hundred and fifty, and uh, detectives get five hundred. Two hundred and fifty to five hundred, depending on your rank. And those are the personalized business cards, so every command will also get the blank business cards as well. So that's what I want to get to. So you need to go through two hundred and fifty to five hundred business cards. Let's say two hundred and fifty for a regular officer, uh, for a police officer. Two hundred and fifty in the in that two and a half months, they ran out of their two hundred fifties, and one thousand eight hundred people decided that they needed more cards. So they made a request to the NYPD. Um, and you're gonna. Would a civilian be able to get their hand on a blank business card? In 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 what sense? I mean, I we provided you with the mock-up, right? With, with a mock-up, but an actual business card. No officer should ever give someone a blank blank card. No, 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 no. I, I let me clarify. When I say blank business card, I don't mean that a civilian gets a blank card. What I mean is that an officer ran out of the pre-printed card with his or her name on it. So the blank card is the one that has a dash, but they are obligated to write their name in when they give so, it over to. So I guess what I'm asking these. So we're going to you're going to see someone with a blank business card, blank one. That's not an officer. So in that case, the officer gave that person a blank business card without any information in it. Well, that's a, that's I, I a concern know. for me. I don't know if I would jump to that conclusion. I mean, so an where, officer so, should so not... So maybe they, pre, maybe they printed it? No. Well, I, the civilian I mean, printed I, it? Well, a couple of points. So point number one is there is a possibility that an officer can drop a card or lose a card and they could get picked up. That's a possibility, right? An officer should not be giving out a blank card to a civilian. That's against the department protocol. So if somebody has a card, can somebody make a photocopy of a card? Sure, uh, but I'm not alleging some sort of kind Conspiracy. of... Conspiracy. Yeah, right, I'm so, not doing that, but it, so I'm my, not... My point, is, uh, I, my point is not necessarily, it's just, I just want to know who keeps track, and I think that the chair asked the same question. Who keeps track on how these business cards are being handed out? 250, if every single, if we have 1,800 people have given out 250 cards in just um, two months, that's a lot of business cards that should be out and about. In, in, and those are only, and, and that's not including, we don't know the level two stops because you don't keep that number, but that's 2,500 level three stops, um, of which the 2,500 level three stops, there were 300, 400 of those, um, which is about 20% were a uh, consent searches. So out of the 2,500, about 20% are consent searches. Um, does that seem like a high number of consent searches, um, considering the amount of stops that are happening? I, I don't know if I can really answer that. I mean, it's w what really is a high number. We're, we're very early on in the process, and this is the point I was making. We're not a full quarter in, full reporting quarter in. We have we have the reports that we're doing. I think what I'm gleaning from the report that I'm seeing is that um, if I'm going to look at it through, you know, a more positive lens, I can see that we have asked 419 times and 51 individuals 
denied consent, which means that they were uh, they were properly um, uh, you know um, requested consent. They understood their rights and they chose not to consent. Other right. individuals chose to consent. So I, I most mean, of the individuals chose to consent. But there was so twenty percent. My what I'm trying to get at is twenty percent of stops that are level three per, are require consent searches is what I'm adding here. You can't do a consent search at level two, right? Yeah, you can, you yeah. can. So you can do a consent search at level two where you don't need a body camera? Well, body, so the body camera needs to be on for any search. Um, you can see, you can ask for consent search at level two and level three. Okay, so um, can the NYPD provide us with 368 videos that show the consent search happening? Or do I have to foil, or would I have to foil that? Or can the NYPD give me that? I just want to see how the officers are doing to see their performance and see, you know, if they're complying, make sure that everything is is, is happening. Yeah, I mean, we, we can we can certainly talk about how how that's, you know, how to comply with such a request. I mean, mm -hmm. it's done, it, it, it is done through a foil process. Yeah. Um, you know, we certainly provide individuals with their body camera footage. That's part of your bill. And, um, you know, we provide them the mechanism to request it. We provide them the expedited stop report for a level three. We would provide them with the body-worn camera footage now. Now, I, the other thing to keep in mind is only recently has there been the injunction preventing us from releasing body camera footage was lifted. So, I mean, that, that's an important thing to recognize, that we weren't able to um, provide body camera footage based on the court injunction in the PBA case over 50A. So that has been lifted in towards the end of February. So we now are able to utilize and provide these during the FOIL process. Let me chime in here for a second. Can the committee come in and see video? Would, would I'm you sure we'll access? Arrange something. Yeah. Okay. We'd like to, we'd like to and do that. And sampling. Yeah. So I don't want the perfect stops to show up. So how do we come in and just look at an array I mean, we can. Okay. I mean, we. I think you would agree that we have set up yeah. situations for mm -hmm. you know when upon request where we've given briefings, mm -hmm. and you know and um, responded to requests. We can work together after the okay. hearing and set something. Awesome. Yeah. I'm just so just to let you know, the numbers just don't. They feel out of whack to me. That, that's all. There's just some numbers here that when you put them together, um, either you know the cops are commonly making consent searches that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, have no reasonable suspicion or probable cause, right? That's why you would need a consent search, right? Well, Without you, it, you can search them as of right. Well, you can, you can seek consent to search at someone at reasonable suspicion. Um, not Probable cause, you don't need it anymore, but the reasonable suspicion, you can seek to consent to search. Because um, okay. you can't search them. You can frisk someone as a matter of right, but you can't search them as a matter of right, right. As, at, at uh, level three reasonable suspicion. So 20% of the time, the officers are going to these people and asking them to search them. Uh, I feel that's really high. I feel like there should be more uh, reasonable suspicion or actual probable cause for them to ask for these type of searches. 20% is a significant number in my, in my account. But so I'm just doing back of the paper math. It just doesn't sound right. And then out of those people, only 90% of them, 90% of them, more or less, said, yes, search me, even though I have the right to walk away, which is also a number that I think is unusual. Um, and these are just, I'm just saying that I think they're unusual. Maybe I'm the only one that sees it that way. But if an officer tells me, hey, you don't need to do this search, I'm going to say, oh, no, I don't want to do this search. That's the, what I would take. I also want to know, out of these consent searches, can I get a number of how many people actually were arrested or got criminally charged? We can look into that for you. That, that is also something I would like, because then we get to the to another point where folks might be, in, they're incriminating themselves uh, with full knowledge that they don't need to be searched. And, that, and that's when I, I start I, I start seeing if this is working, right? Um, and I'm not saying that we want to protect criminals or do anything like that. All I'm saying is if I know that I have something that could get me arrested and I have an option not to be searched, I'm probably not going to ask to be searched. So I want to know in what cases did these folks end up being arrested because they were searched, and how many consented to a search there? I want to see what rate that is. I just want to. Sure. I just want to be able to note it. Sure. Um, so for me, I guess your data is, is, is not conclusive. It's very early, but just the numbers just seem very. They're all over the place for me. Um, 
the, how many cards are people? One thousand eight off, eight hundred offers already running out of cards is a big problem for no, me. But, n- well, that that's not that they're running out of cards. It, it's it's an example of of the system that you codified in law working, right? So they came to they're engaging the public. They're giving out the cards as you want them to do. They came to the realization they're running low on cards. They reordered cards to replenish their stock. That's that's not an example of something bad. That's an example of what you wanted in the law. It's yeah. this I, part is working. I I want to I. I don't see it the same way. Um, 1,800 means yes, you're right. If they're giving them out in a in a meaningful way and they're building community and so forth, but then I just feel like 1,800 officers have given out 252 more cards in the public. That that would be great if that's the idea. But also, my problem is access to blank cards. I want to limit the access to blank cards. I don't want any opportunity for someone to get a blank card in the public. I just want you. I, I just want the, the regular business card. So, so my, I, right I, now, 1,800 officers in the city of New York that are very good at what they're doing, according to you, because they're handing them out regularly, have blank cards, and I don't think that's acceptable. No, but that, that's we need to clarify this because that's not what I said at all. What I said is it doesn't mean that they have blank cards. I know they're not blank. They have to fill them in. No, but that's not what I'm even saying. I'm not even saying that. They could have realized when they got down to 50 pre-printed cards, I need to reorder more cards. They may have never gotten to the point that they use the card that they need to hand write. They They followed the protocol that you set out. It doesn't mean that they ran out and they were left with nothing. Uh, the officer could have said, okay, I had 250, well, I'm down to 50. We could go back Let and forth. We, both, you're giving an anecdote, I'm giving an anecdote. We're just making stuff up right now. We don't know for certain. So I know I that 1,800 officers need uh, cards, want more cards. No, we know that 1,800 officers ordered more cards pursuant to the protocol that we created that you dictated in your bill, and that does not mean, and we shouldn't jump to the conclusion, that they were giving out blank cards. We, we just don't have... Not blank. I guess they're giving but, out the cards that are blank that they have to fill in. That's what I'm saying. But even that, we can't jump to that conclusion. But why... All we know is <laughs> that 1,800 officers were running Oleg, low on that's, cards. That's very backwards. Everyone cards. in this room, that if you're saying that if you run out of cards or you're about to run out of cards, you should ask for more, 1,800 officers are either about to run out of cards or don't have cards. That's the, the general assumption that someone would have. You're either about to run out or you have run out, okay. so you make a request. Okay. What I don't want is any of those officers to walk around with cards that they have to fill in. I want them to have the real card, because I don't want an opportunity where there's a misprint, uh, miswriting, or people giving out blank cards, or the opportunity, uh, an opportunity not to give out that card. That's all I'm saying is- uh, Council member, I got you, but th- the idea behind, when this bill was being drafted, the idea behind it was to, to ensure that we're, we're not left with a situation where we have an encounter with an individual in the street and we have nothing to give them. And the safeguard to that was, what if a situation happens that an officer ran out of cards? Is there something that we can give them? Now, one of the solutions was stay behind the old way, give them your name, rank, and shield number, have the person write it down, and that's it. And one of the, the, the thought process behind not going right to that process was, well, they won't have the 311 number on the back, they won't have the URL on the back. We could achieve this interim solution by having a card where an officer can write their name down to, to fill a gap while these cards are being printed if they waited too long. Right. Otherwise, if they didn't wait too long and, and triggered the reorder at 50, then they never ran out and they never had to go to the other card. I, I don't disagree with you. I, I think we're saying the same thing. Yeah, that. okay. <laughs> uh, how long does it take for someone to get a card after they request cards? It should take less than a week. So about a week. Okay, so n- they never have these blank cards for more than a week. Worst case scenario. Correct. Okay, exactly. It's, we're all on the same page. I think Oleg is, is, you're concerned about what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I don't want yeah. people with those blank cards and you guys have a system by which that should happen very rarely. The next thing, the last thing is um, the stops that are happening though are still happening in mostly black and brown communities. Out of all the stops, I have two, 317 stops out of 368 happening to mostly black and Hispanic males. Uh, do, is there an issue as to why that exists? That's over 86% of the stops happening in uh, consent searches happening in black and brown communities. So, again, I mean, I think it's th- that is the number you're accurately saying it. It is the first partial quarter that we're seeing. I think they're roughly tracking 
the stop and frisk numbers, uh, the the um, the level three encounters. They're roughly tracking that, and generally speaking, we know that consent searches generally fall into the level three stop. So we're seeing that correlation, but again, this is a really early correlation to make because I, although the stop, the um, level three stop numbers, the stop and frisk numbers have been out for quite some time, year over year, and we could make comparisons back to 2011 and see how the numbers have plummeted. We don't have that that reference base with with consent to search, but we will have it. I mean, this is and so this is my last question. So I guess what I'm the insight that I get from that is that in cases when there is no reasonable suspicion or limited reasonable suspicion and no probable cause that black and brown people are still being stopped at a disproportionate rate than white people. Before, it was a, a stop and frisk happened, you just go after everyone and, and it's fine and there's no way to judge whether or not there's some type of profiling happening, let's say. Even though the, it, 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 we found out eventually that it was uh, uh, unconstitutional. The point that I'm making in this one case where the officer's uh, uh, discretion as to whether or not he should stop someone uh, is based on reasonable suspicion and probable cause. Over 85, I think it's 86 percent of the time, they're doing that to black and brown people. These are cases when the officer could just walk away because there's not enough evidence there to call for a legal search. They could walk away and not do a consent search. They're doing it at a disproportionate rate to black and brown people. That's a big problem. Because they have a choice now. There's a there's a there's a no need for them to continue their police work if they need to ask consent if they need to get consent because they don't they don't see enough evidence there to to move forward. But they do that specifically to black and brown people, and that that is a big concern for me when it comes to the the numbers that I have in front of me that over eighty six percent are happening to black and brown people. Like, do you have? Any statement to yeah, make? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think base, based again, and I don't know where the the level three stop data breaks out for that last quarter, October 19th, but let's, for argument's sake, let's use the numbers that you provided that um, divided by four, and, and you'll have about, you said 2,500, uh, and you said 20% of that are consent searches. So we know that in 80%, so the demographics tend to break the same way as the consent searches, generally speaking. And what we know to your point is in 80% then of those level three stops, a consent search was not sought. It was sought based on what you said in, in the 20%. Again, I'm using your numbers because I don't want to get married to the numbers. I don't know that breakout. But so we know that. Um, what we're going to see over time, and again, it's, I'm going to keep repeating this because we're, we're drawing conclusions from a partial first quarter, you know, so we want to see how these numbers play out over, over a few quarters. We want to see if there's any kind of trends, but I, I, I recognize what you're saying. I, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, but we don't necessarily know that, you know, where those consent searches break out. So was there probable cause to arrest based on that was that developed and we know that in in the vast majority which is 80 percent based on the kind of approximation that we're making that consent was not asked for and that's again not capturing level two stops either so thank you uh to, for asking this thank you uh, and for allowing me to ask those questions thank no you. problem thank you thank you councilman Reynoso. And, and before i pass it to uh council member adams uh, do you agree these numbers need to change i mean you know it seems specifically um when we look at numbers vastly across a lot of policing in the city you look at marijuana 86 percent of all arrests were in black and brown communities uh would you agree that we should try to nip this in the butt early before the numbers start to look like they've historically looked in other areas before uh, we had to move into uh, more oversight and, and stronger conversations around them. So if we're noticing a pattern early, the question is, will the police, do you, do you agree with what I'm saying, one, but two, do you think we should try to make some changes now before the numbers 
Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's hard to call it a pattern when we only have one quarter. So we need to see a few quarters to, to actually call it a pattern. But I, I think to your larger point, which I would agree with, and I think the commissioner and, and you would agree that the department has gone down this road. When you take a look at a height of 685,000 stops in 2011 and you're down to 11,000 in 2018, 98, more than 98% drop. When you look at 140,000 fewer arrests, from 2014 to 2018, when you're looking at 75% decreases in summonses, right, where we work together on the um, Criminal Justice Reform Act to issue civil summonses, but criminal court summonses are down from, what, 360,000 to under 90,000. I think what you would agree with me on is, is that that is precisely where the department is going. Right. We're trying to find solutions that are not necessarily always enforcement solutions. Right. And that's why I, I want to know the numbers in, in most of these voluntary consent stops, you know, were there weapons found, you know, were, were these individuals arrested? Uh, and, and I'll just equate this, you know, I don't want to equate this to basketball, but, you know, this is, this is looking like the New York Knicks down by 30 in the first quarter. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying it's not possible for them to come back in the fourth quarter and win the game, um, but it's not likely. So if we can have some star power early on um, in this fight, we perhaps won't be down by 60 in the fourth quarter. Um, sorry, but, but, but you get my point. We're seeing the numbers move in a certain direction. Well, I, I, I just mean, want to harp on it. I'm just saying again, it early we, we have, enough to get it out. I, I get it yeah. noted okay. um, again, and I'm not going to you know, repeat yeah. the fact that we're very early on yeah. and we don't have a lot to you know, to compare, forgive us for being leery. Compare, but I, I know what you're saying. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go to Councilmember Adams. Thank you, Chair Richards. Thank you very much for your testimony Thank you. uh, today. We really do appreciate it. Um, I, I'm going to try to be brief. Uh, in echoing a lot of my colleagues' sentiments today and being very, very concerned of that 86 percent uh, in our black and brown communities who are affected. Uh, by this, and we want to to make sure that they are affected positively by this law. My concern is still with the monitoring, uh, if you will, of of compliance with with the law. Um, how are you making sure that officers who are giving out cards in all of the circumstances? Um, in, in, in which they're supposed to? Are you utilizing uh, body-worn cameras? How exactly are you measuring uh, officers' intake? So uh, body-worn cameras do go on the two at, uh, at level two, at level three, uh, during searches. So if we go down the line of, um, of, of buckets that are envisioned in, in um, local law, it's either 54 or 56, um, the, the, the contact card bill. Um, the vast majority of those buckets are captured in the body-worn camera policy, and there is body-worn camera footage. Uh, we do do audits of the body-worn camera footage based on our federal monitorship. Um, we clearly, as we move further out from implementation, uh, we're going to utilize CCRB data and see what they're seeing see where we need to train, see where the pockets are of issues if we start seeing issues, see if this is more of a across-the-board issue that we're witnessing or if it's focused on certain precincts that we're seeing it. And maybe you don't need a department-wide refresher, maybe you need refreshers in certain areas. But again, as I said, it's we're a little early, but those are all of the things that we're looking at. And we're not saying that's a comprehensive list. We may see things in the data as we get this data that's going to kind of shine light and give us some other solutions and directions that we're not seeing. So we're, we want to make this work. We, I think we've shown that when the bill was passed and we actively worked on negotiations on these bills, but once we came to that solution and the bills passed, we jumped in and we wanted to make sure it worked. We did pilots, we did focus groups. These things weren't required in the law. We wanted to make it work. We didn't want to 
blow this off, and we wanted to make sure that everything was play, was was working the right way. We had the go date on October 19th. Now we want to see and reflect on what are we seeing. Are we seeing complaints for noncompliance? Are we witnessing through our audits that things aren't working the way they we envisioned them to work? And we're going to make changes to ensure that the spirit of the law is upheld. Thank you. And. Uh, have you seen many uh, issues of noncompliance? Uh, do you have a figure of uh, noncompliance thus far? If so, what was the disciplinary action? We, we don't. And again, that, the, the point I was making is CCRB, all of these complaints were, are being filtered to CCRB. So they're going to be able to give numbers in the panel after us and uh, what the substantiation rates relative to that were. But Again, I, I don't know what those numbers are, but I would caution that, you know, like any other big rollout of, of a new piece of legislation, there's going to be a learning curve. And we want to see, you know, it's not necessarily that officers are opposed or willfully disregarding what this protocol is. It's, it's just something new. It's something that they need to be trained. And what we want to see is, you know, is more training necessary? Uh, you know, are we seeing willful disregard? I mean, these are things that we're going to see, but we're going to need to wait a little bit to reflect and see. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to Councilmember Deutsch, followed by Deutsch. We'll hear from Menchaca. Councilmember Menchaca. Thank you, Chair. You know, as we move on, we're going to be um, talking about more on this issue and the Right to Know Act and to see how it progresses within the New York City Police Department. And, uh, and I appreciate you, you being here today and testifying and speaking of all the positive outcomes of um, this, this bill, how it affects um, all New Yorkers. So I have a few questions. I'm going to keep it very brief. Number one is that um, do you see any negative impact that um, this is happening on, on this is happening on offices on their personal safety? Number one, number two, is that if it's a level three stop, um, does the officer have a, uh, is the officer permitted to um, obtain ID from the person he or she stopped and run uh, his or her name uh, to see if there's any outstanding warrants? So uh, I'll, let, uh, I'll let Mike talk to the level three, you know, the protocols behind level three. In terms of um, threats, I, again, I think it's just, just like the other, um, some of the other conclusions uh, that, that we were talking about, I think it's a little early to tell. I mean, I, I think you know and a lot of the council members know and through the course of other hearings, we, we highlight the fact that uh, officers are the subject of threats. We had, over the last two years, an average of about 150 direct threats against police officers and another 150 per year of general threats against police officers. And this is not a correlation to, to contact cards. This is just the reality of the world we live in. Officers' safety gets threatened with fair regularity, and that's something that we monitor and keep an eye on. And although I can't reach that conclusion, you know, that correlation now, I mean, that's cer certainly something that we always keep an eye on. So during the process of a, um, when the officer offers um, his uh, identification and has to do other means of uh, communication before the officer does his or her job, now, do you see any downside of the officer putting um, their personal safety as far as that when it comes to um, moving along with the Right to Know Act, moving along with um, making sure that we do everything properly. I mean, again, so I like think if, I if, think you're, if you're approaching someone and the first thing, you, what, is, what is the procedure on the level three? What is the procedure? What, do, what does the officer have to need to do? When you're approaching someone at level three, you're yeah. supposed to identify yourself um, and state your purpose for the interaction unless certain exceptions apply, like exigent circumstances. Um, so, you know, I think if they had a good idea that someone has a gun in their pocket, they probably can go straight and frisk that pocket and not wait for, I'm Officer Clark and I'm here to search you because I believe you have a gun. Like, they're exigent circumstances. But outside of that, they're supposed to identify themselves and say, I'm stopping you because you fit the description of someone, crime in progress or whatever. 
reasons. So is the officer on the level three? Is the officer uh, permitted to um, obtain ID even okay. if the, if even if that individual refuses to uh, have the bags uh, searched? Right, they're allowed to ask for ID, but uh, individuals aren't required to provide it. And they're not required to provide at, any ident right, identification at a level three interaction. Uh huh. Um, if you're driving a car, that's obviously different. But for like on a, on the you know on pedestrian on the street, they're not required to provide ID. So but from the so from the eleven thousand stops, um, you mentioned actually um, you mentioned fifty uh, from the four hundred nineteen. You mentioned fifty one refused consent, and that that um, includes uh, giving uh, ID, correct? No, that that refusing is refusing to be searched. To be searched. Right. And now from that amount, how many actually gave ID? Like if so, if fifty one refused to be searched. Did, that 50, did those 51 um, consent to give ID? They may, maybe, maybe not. I don't think we have data on how, how often we're asking for ID. I know, I know we don't have that data. So um, once someone gives ID, then you have a right to uh, run the person's name to see if there's any outstanding warrants, correct? Yeah, I, th I think, yeah, yeah, you can do that. But it's, I mean, you can't prolong the interaction to do that. Like if you can do it within the time you would normally be d doing on the stop. So my question is, like, from the 11,000 stops, so if from the 11,000, um, let's assume there's a certain percentage that refused to give consent to have the bags searched, but from the 11,000, they all agreed to give the ID to the officer, right? And, and the officer now has a right to uh, check um, the ID to see if there's any outstanding warrants of the person um, was previously arrested and for what it was. We have no numbers on that. I, I am pretty sure we don't have. No, we, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're not checking how often we request. Do you, these do, you, do you believe it's important to check these um, stats in order to understand? I mean, I think personally that it's important to know this as we continue <coughs> talking about how this, um, how these bills. Um, progress yeah. to see um, how many people that actually stopped may have been arrested for gun possession, may have been arrested for other types of violent crimes, um, and as well as to see how many people have warrants for possibly some violent crimes. This way we could see how to better not only um, make sure that uh, New Yorkers are protected, but the people that are doing the jobs to protect New Yorkers, that uh, they have families as well and that they are protected as well. So, I mean, I think, you know, I think we have to look at it a couple of different ways. So if a level three elevates and gives an officer probable cause to make an arrest, that, off, that individual is arrested, we clearly know their name, we can we know their criminal history. We know, you know, who these who these folks are. At a level three encounter, that's that where we have reasonable suspicion, but it does not uh, rise to probable cause where we're making an arrest. That individual will be free to go. We would not detain that individual to run their warrant history to see what their resume, you know, was to the extent they had one. Uh, that wouldn't be proper. Um, nor is that individual obligated to give us ID. They can refuse ID just as they can refuse a consent search. We could ask for it. They don't have to give it to us. So we could have a situation where we're at a level three. We ask for a person's name. They refuse to give us, they, they refuse to identify themselves. We ask for consent to search. They refuse consent to search. And then nothing out of that level three stop elevates the probable cause and they're leaving the scene. So, I mean, I, I, I hope that answers the question. Okay, sort of. Okay, I just want to uh, finally just say um, I want to thank the, the sponsors of these bills, how important uh, this is um, in order to have accountability uh, on the offices who are out there. And, um, and, I, th and I think we're moving in the right direction. Uh, but we also need to make sure that um, overall, as time goes on, that um, you know, we, not only do we, 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 you know, we, we protect um, the citizens of the city, but we also protect those uh, law enforcement officers who are out there doing the job. And just to show, um, just a few days ago, Anthony Salgado, who was arrested three times within a short period of time, 
uh, once um, grabbing an officer's tasers, and a second time attacking a correction officer, and a third time um, uh, injuring an officer um, during uh, um, at that at the hospital while he while he, while he was in custody. Um, so this is very concerning to me. Um, yes, we're speaking about. Um, um, you know, making sure that there's accountability with the police department. But at the same time, we need to show that there's accountability that when an officer is doing his or her job, that they are protected as well. And we as New Yorkers, we have to take everything into account and, and look at both sides and look at um, overall how these bills will, uh, imp how, how these bills are being implemented, that it should be done properly 100% to make sure that it works right. So I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Deutsch. And I think you made some valid points. I think we were, we were dragging you further left for a second. Um, but you made some really valid points. I think at the end of the day, we want to ensure that all of these voluntary consent searches are actually ending up with something, right? You know, I think the department talks about precision policing. Uh, how precise are we really being if you're stopping over, I mean, if you're searching over 300 individuals and really not finding anything. So that's why that data, the data component mm -hmm. is so important here because it will tell us whether we are in, in, in one sense really precisely identifying those who could bring harm to our communities and also to our officers as well. But we need to know that these searches are searches that are meaningful um, because they, you know, there's a public safety threat there. And we'll, we'll get the data, and I'll also look in, I have in my notes, uh, what, what we're recovering. All right, thank you. Going to go to Council Member Menchaca. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the NYPD team for being here today. Uh, I, I have two sets of questions, and one of them are really thinking about engagement of the neighborhoods and the representatives of our communities that can be part of shifting and changing and evolving the patrol guide, uh, which is like the, the Bible, if you will, of the NYPD. You know, I, I've been uh, in some of your, with some of your predecessors a very long time ago in these spaces where the patrol guide was getting changed. And it takes time, it takes effort, but it really gets into a better place when you have really good engagement. And there were some agreements that were made as we moved forward uh, to, to change these guidelines with community at the table. And so are you aware of any, any issues that the community advocates have raised, uh, specifically speaking to patrol guide changes in language? Relative to, to right to know. Right to know. This is all about right to know. You have? Yeah. Are you aware of any, yes, uh, of any issues? Yeah, yeah. I know. Uh, because I, I want to make sure that I can kind of walk through some of these issues. And on, on the record, you can kind of respond to some of those issues. And I think what what's... Uh, what comes to mind first is the specific changes that were made to training, written guide, guidance, operation orders, consent forms, and reporting protocols for home and vehicle consent searches, uh, if any, to ensure that they conform to the Right to Know Act. Will you share copies of these documents with the council and advocates? So, yeah, I mean, I think we should, maybe I should kind of start with a little bit of an overview. Please. Um, we... We did meet with advocates. Uh, some advocates we met earlier on. Some advocates we met uh, we met with a little later on in the process. With that said, even the advocates we met with later on in the process, we listened to their concerns with uh, the patrol guide procedures that we were doing uh, that we were putting out. And although it was too late to actually m change uh, the patrol guide procedure. Uh, because rollout was about a month away. What we did commit to is taking a look at their suggestions and when we do our next revision, and as I said earlier, anything this large, we wait until it's rolled out for, you know, six, eight, nine months, you know, and to see is there anything operationally that we need to change because it's just not working, there's hiccups in the process. And that generally happens not, in, not even in high profile situations such as this. So what we committed to is that when we do that reflection and revision, we will try to implement some of the suggestions that they made to us uh, right, right prior to the rollout. One of which was 
to make language line a little more prominent in this procedure. So the way we generally do it when it comes to language line was we have a patrol guide procedure that deals with language access and which applies across the board. So we have a procedure in the patrol guide that deals with language access. Some of the advocates had said to us, well, given what the requirements of this law were and, and what, the, what the bill intended, it would be good to actually insert uh, something along the lines referencing language access right in, right in the provision, right, right in that section, something we don't normally do. You've seen the patrol guide. It's online. It's quite lengthy. Mm -hmm. uh, but we said, okay, that's, that's something reasonable. That's something we can do. Another thing that I think you started off with was um, better clarity on consent searches, uh, whether in the street, a car, a home, mm -hmm. and they raised that, you know, they would have liked to see more clarity so it's clearer to officers that this applies to home searches as well as to car searches, not only consent searches of bags in the public. Now, although that's the way we trained it, uh, when they highlighted that, we said, okay, so when we do our revision, we'll try to augment a little bit to make it clearer that uh, in writing that it applies in all of those scenarios as well. Um, so we sat down, um, although I, I know that, that some of the advocates weren't happy that we didn't implement immediately before, uh, we did commit to um, looking at their suggestions and trying to implement as many as we could, as many as we agreed with, in the subsequent revision in which we intend on doing. And when is that subsequent revision? I mean, we're, what, I think we're about five or six, six months in into the rollout. Um, we're already looking at it. I don't know if we're, we're gonna start revising just yet, but we're already starting to look at revisions and these are the things that I highlighted are on the table that are going to make make the cut and not to say that that's an exhaustive list but you know those are two things that come to mind how how often are you meeting with advocates and is there is there like a a a monthly meeting where you can both kind of hear directly from uh, advocates about implementation as it's happening uh, so that you can both kind of get a sense on the ground, not necessarily data that you're not capturing, because we're already kind of seeing some holes in some of the data capture, but just a, a kind of touch point so that advocates can kind of sit and talk to you a little bit about violations. I was at a press conference earlier today where people were talking about how people are violating uh, the Right to Know Act already, and they're seeing that. And there's CCRB process, there's all these processes, but we can add, we can always add more opportunities to engage. Uh, would you commit to sitting down with, with communities, uh, community av advocates to, to kind of talk through some of that stuff, create a space for dialogue uh, on a regular basis? I mean, we've, we've, we've done it before. We've done it in, in a variety of realms. We're never opposed to sitting down with, with advocates, you know, uh, and hearing their input on any of our programs, especially something as, as large as this. Okay, great. So it sounds like you're open to that, and we can definitely follow up on that. And back to the language line, this is another kind of important thing, uh, vulnerable communities uh, and, and really looking at immigrants in the city. Language line becomes one of those things that sometimes works, and then, and then most of the time it just doesn't work. Are you, are you um, uh, recording how many times interpretation services are, are being asked for in communicating? with searches or any of the right to know act oh, relative interactions to, relative to right to know relative um, to, well, we just stick there because no not specifically i can take a look um if we report anywhere or capture anywhere how many times we utilize language services generally speaking i know that we're not capturing how many times but again i, I think it's important then to to highlight another point that Consent searches, if we recover anything from a consent search uh, that's incriminating, that results in an individual's arrest, uh, that's subject to oversight of the courts. So, and the, the test that a judge would, would put upon a situ uh, consent search is whether the consent was obtained voluntarily, knowingly, and intelligently. Clearly, if somebody doesn't speak the language in which the request was asked, they're not consenting intelligently and knowingly. I think we would all agree on that and the evidence would be suppressed. So from our standpoint, it doesn't make much sense 
to ask somebody that doesn't speak English for consent to search in English, them giving us consent only to go to court and have the evidence thrown out. It just it d wouldn't make too much sense. So uh, we utilize language services. I had ca a count on how many times it was done in this, you know, in, in the realm of uh, consent searches. I don't know. Um, well, so what, what I want to do, and I don't know if you wanted to add. I'm yeah, and I was just going to add, we also, I mean, we have language line, which is going to be a subset of it. But we also have many thousands of bilingual officers who wouldn't necessarily need it if they're fluent in the language they're speaking. The yeah, of course. And that's, so, the, like, that's the goal, right, right. to have. So the language line may not necessarily cover every instance where they still were able to provide proper you know, explanation of their rights. Okay, and, and I guess I'll, I'll end with this. Uh, on, on this language line conversation, I think, I think what's important here is that, that we understand if there's, a, if, there's a, if there's a process, if an officer is moving down their line of questioning that will get to consent, they're going to do everything they can to ensure that there's solid uh, process. But what we're talking about is all those times that there's not a solid process and, and, and essentially there's abuse of power here. And, and I think that's what we're trying to figure out how many of those instances people are asked for a language line where they know that, that there was a, an abuse of power by the police officer. Uh, and I think those are the cases that we're talking about. Those are the things that, that make, make it difficult for communities when they feel surveillanced, over surveillanced. And so it's not, it's not those cases that work really well where they know that there's, there's, there's been the good work of the police to do the investigation, to know they're gonna go in and they're ready. It's all those other times that are messy and, and really causing a lot of, of, of um, backlash from the neighborhoods. That's, that's so, so really getting a sense about how many, how many requests are being asked for language line, those are important things that we can kind of document. Um, last question is about DNA and, and, and kind of um, recording DNA and, and using DNA as a way of, of um, and I want to get the question right because this is about consent and search consent related searches. Um, does NYPD inform people in custody who are taken into what the detectives guide, guides describe as controlled environment in the precinct, uh, interrogation rooms, those kind of things, that, uh, that anything a prisoner drinks or smokes uh, in the room will be collected for DNA? I mean, I'll, I can certainly look in and get back to you. I didn't realize that this was the implementation of right to know oversight, so I didn't really brush up on my. No, and I, and I, and I understand that. But, I'll, but I'll, this is all kind of in the realm I'll of like, how do you create consent? You. I'll certainly get back to you on okay. the protocols. Thank you so much. Thank you for bringing that up uh, because we're going to have a whole lot more questions on that, uh, but not at this hearing. But I am interested in how consent works out uh, when it comes to DNA. Uh, as well. Um, so I would say we should start getting ready for those questions. Um, um, before I turn to Councilmember Miller, I wanted to go into 311 again. Uh, so individuals can obviously file a 311 complaint and it is supposed to uh, be forwarded to CCRB, but in some cases we've heard that is not happening. And we all know that 311 sometimes works. I'm not saying it's not an effective way to to resolve city issues, but sometimes those complaints may not be forwarded to CCRB. Uh, so how would you track it then? I mean, we we don't run 311 at the NYPD. Um, the assumption, I guess, that we start with is that if somebody calls 311 with a complaint, right to know related, that it gets forwarded to CCRB. Again, we put on our URL, we link, um, we provide contact information for CCRB on the URL, which is printed on the back of the card as well. So 311 number is actually printed on the back of the card. Our URL is printed on the back of the card. And when you go there, you actually, you get 311 and CCRB that you can call to make a complaint. Right. Um, so, I, I mean, I really can't speak intelligently. Right. But, there, but I'm sure the NYPD deals would do it in other agencies. So just making sure that that process is working. And I mean, we have an op obligation to do that as well, but I just want to make sure that that's also acknowledged as well, that 311 does not always forward complaints uh, the way it should. Um, I also wanted to add on um, 
So level two stops, so you, you don't have to track those, obviously, but do you track them? No. So, I mean, through the federal monitorship, what's, what's tracked are level three stops. I mean, we clearly track level four because that's arrest mm -hmm. or summons. So we know how many people we're arresting and summonsing. So we track that as well. But based on the federal monitorship and, and 250s, uh, stop question and frisks historically, um, that's the level that's tracked. And that's not something you would never entertain level twos? Well, I mean, I don't think we need to be told by a monitor to just track data <laughs> I mean, I, I, um, so I, is there I do think there's a pilot program that we're working on to track level twos um, yeah. good afternoon <clears throat> my name is deputy chief John Cosgrove I'm the commanding officer of the risk management bureau we are the bureau responsible for coordinating uh, with the monitor the federal monitor um, the court ordered a uh, pilot program back in July of 2018 to record uh, all level one and level two stops. The court further ordered in August that the body-worn camera, body -worn cameras be utilized to record all level one and level two stops. In November of 18, the uh, federally, uh, the court-appointed monitor uh, d designed, submitted to the court a framework for designing a pilot program that would impact uh, 12 precincts and PSAs throughout the city. Um, that framework is currently under discussion with both ourselves, uh, both by the department, the monitor himself, and the uh, plaintiff's attorneys for the three different cases. Um, there are some aspects that need to be uh, ironed out to see if it's feasible at all. They involve uh, civilian observers and um, some electronic modification of electronic app program within our smartphones. So. Um, it's anticipated that we'll come to some uh, type of uh, pilot framework that we can actually uh, complete uh, and participate in, but uh, that would be that's what we have on the horizon for level two stops. And you are doing as, as you said in some precincts, uh, level one and two interactions, <clears throat> right? But body cameras and any any uh, stop, any stop, right? Is supposed to be recorded on a body camera, right? Right. right. Um, but what I'm getting at is. Level so, two. So when it comes to the Right to Know Act, Correct. eventually, and, and one of the reasons, once again, I voted against the second half of the bill is because a lot of our interactions are level one stops, predominantly in our communities, and they're not necessarily covered under these specific bills. Um, but the question is, would you ever entertain level one stops, period, when it comes to Right to Know Act? Well, I... I don't think so, and I'll, I'll explain why. Because I think level one stops, I don't think they're necessarily limited to any, any particular type of community. I think they're so common. In, in, and an example I, I like to generally give is, you know, you're looking for a missing child and an officer is walking through uh, Central Park or Union Square Park and asking individuals, encountering individuals and asking questions about have you seen the child and whatever. These basic interactions would fall under and they happen every day throughout the city. We take a look at 911 calls, which a lot of them may result in level one encounters, over six million of them. I mean, there's there's millions of these encounters that happen uh, on a routine basis. Where we tried to focus with, with Right to Know is the encounters where accusatory questions begin, not a basic encounter where we're actively telling our officers affirmatively get out there and speak to people, that's neighborhood policing, engage with the public, and tying a mandatory you know, card that's linked to level three stops and level two stops, which are accusatory stops in their in nature, you know, to an innocent or a, a basic stop for a request for, for information. Uh, we don't think that's probably the right approach, um, you know, just the sheer volume of cards that would be dispensed. Now, that's not to say that there can't be a scenario at level one where a card wouldn't be handed out. An officer can voluntarily hand out cards, and we encourage that as part of neighborhood policing. Individuals can ask an officer for a card. An officer under the policy that we created would be obligated to give a business card if asked, even at a level one. Um, so we try to cover a level one as much as we can, but I think as a mandate in, in right to know, I. I, I don't think that that would be prudent. And I'll just, let me, just, and I'm going to move to Councilman Miller, but 
you know, as we talk about building community police relations, let's imagine there is a three-year-old young lady, on, let's just use the example that you gave in the park, you know, what would be wrong with handing someone a card <laughs> to say, hey, if you got information, if you, if, you, if you receive any information, if you see this child, here's a card. Is the, is the worry that um, you believe officers may get false complaints against them? Is that, is that, mean, that, is that, is that what the premise of? That, that certainly could be a result. I'm not. But how? You know, but I'm, but I, mm-hmm. I think it's just, mm-hmm. you know, it's getting to a place where where you're talking about millions of encounters and you're talking about a mandate. Right. So that, that's what that's what we're really talking about right. when we talk about level one. We're talking about creating the type of mandate that we created for level two and three, mm-hmm. which is a mandate. You have to do it. Mm-hmm. Right. And you're saying to overlay that. Now, there's a limited number of that universe. If level three, there's eleven thousand and eight last year. Level two, there's some subset, but it's a finite number. Level one encounters are millions and you're creating a mandate for millions that if an officer happens to be one, they would have to literally carry around card dispensers on their on their belts. You know, uh, two, if an officer is wrong and, and doesn't give a card, they're susceptible to some sort of a discipline for an innocent uh, basic encounter with a civilian where no accusatory questions are being asked, just a basic conversation and request for information. I, mean, I, I, I agree to disagree, but there are 51 council members. We all have to print cards, and in our travels on the train and other places, we encounter constituents all the time who may have complaints, and we could give out a basic card for them to call the office if they have information or complaints. I, I don't see why it would be hard for well, I those mean, who I can protect certainly and serve the community to do the same thing. I can support a bill that would mandate that you give out a business card every time. <laughs> <laughs> well, would he, we wouldn't need these mandates if we didn't have bad stops. But again, I mean, we, we encourage our officers to we encourage our officers to give out the cards, and we do we do. Yeah, do. and I and I do, I do want to give props to the 105th Priest, and I had a, I what I believe a sanitation truck hit my car when they with the plow. Anyway, that's another story for another day. I, I'm not even going to go after the city for this because it probably I'll probably be 50 by the time um, we even settled. Um, so yeah, Donovan had to come out of. Uh, pocket for dollars. But anyway, that's another story for another day. But they did give me a card after the interaction. Mm-hmm. I, again, we... I mean, I was shocked I got a card, but I got a card. Well, I, I, I don't think that... I don't think that necessarily shocking. was a bad interaction. I, I wasn't... I didn't feel the need to call CCRB because we because the police department handed me a card. And again, I, I don't think there. I'm not yeah. jumping to that conclusion. Yeah. I just think that yeah. given the sheer volumes of those okay. encounters, uh, leaving it to an individual to request a card, give, leaving it to an officer to present a card, in those encounters, once accusatory questions start, it's a mandate. It's already there. And that's, uh, that's how we try to separate, uh, separate it out. I'm going to go to Councilmember Miller, but I, I will just let me just reiterate: the most common stops in our communities are level one stops, and unfortunately, they're not going to be counted in this. And it's just it's just a fact. My my every interaction I've had with a police officer from teenager up has been a level one stop, and unfortunately, that's not being engaged uh, in these bills, you know. But um, I, I hope we can have some future conversations about this, especially vehicle stops, which are very common in our communities. All righty, Councilmember Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Actually, that is a little disheartening to hear what you, what you were saying because that almost defeats the purpose of the legislation. So I, I want to begin with that, I, that of the uh, federal uh, the precincts that were under the federal monitorship, I believe that we had two in uh, Southeast Queens, and it's the 103-113. Um, while they have, uh, I, I may say that, that, must say that they, uh, I think we are light years from where we were five or six years ago. Um, quite frankly, if we were able to educate we wouldn't have to legislate. And if we were able to change the culture 
and give people the dignity that they deserve during these encounters, this would not be necessary. How do you, what do you have to give to me to take back to my constituency, saying to be able to say that um, these, this community that had been twice uh, under federal monitorship, that there is a mechanism in place to ensure that um, folks are being treated with the dignity and respect that they deserve, that their, the implementation of the right to know, um, is, there is an element of oversight that will assure that that happens as well. Uh, just in general, what, what, what do I have to take back uh, to reassure folks that this process is working? So I think, um, and I'll, I'll I'll briefly repeat some of the stuff that um, that we talked about earlier in the hearing, which is, you know, in terms of rollout, you know, we gave examples of how we took the bills uh, seriously, and once the bills were passed, and we we you know we participated in the negotiations over the bills, but once the bills were actually passed. We self-initiated a pilot program. We did focus groups with police officers and their supervisors to ensure that they actually understood what their obligations were under the law. What we didn't want to do is wait until October 19th of 2018 and say, you know, issue a directive to be read out loud and say, okay, here are your obligations now. We understood that this was a little complex. There was a consent to search policy. There was co contact card mandates of where you were obligated to give out contact cards. So what we did was um, we wound up, uh, we ran pilot programs to see if the training we were doing, which was roll call training, whether the officers in the four precincts that we piloted, whether they understood what what was going on. And what we realized was is that the training could have been better. They didn't really, it didn't seem like they really understood what their obligations were under the law. What we did after that was created internet-based internet training that was completed by officers before October 19th of 2018. That internet-based training had quizzes attached, so you wouldn't get credit for completing that until you pass the quizzes. Then we did roll call training. We trained our training sergeants to then go and train their troops at roll call. Then we implemented training for future trainings. That wasn't this you know, pre-rollout training, but ongoing. For for example, our recruits in the police academy, every recru recruit class coming out of the police academy is going to learn right to know. Every officer that's going to get assigned to a plain clothes detail, part of the plain clothes training is going to be contact cards. That's from now and going into the future. Um, uh, another example is, uh, what was the? Promotional, uh, promotional training. Sergeants and lieutenants, when they, um, when they get promoted and they have to take a class in training, they're going to get uh, right to know training, and that's from now until ongoing. And then in-service training, where officers go back to the police academy and get trained, we embedded that we embedded right to know into that in-person training. So these these are ongoing trainings that aren't only upfront before the start date. So we did the upfront before the start date, but then we made sure we embedded it to reinforce officers on what their obligations are, reinforce among supervisors that they know what to expect of their officers. Um, based on the way we designed the, the rollout, uh, level two encounters, level three encounters, consent searches, they need to be recorded uh, on body-worn camera, uh, on their body-worn cameras. So what we do is we audit body-worn camera footage. Uh, we put 311 on the back of the contact card to call 311 to comment on the encounter. We also put a link to a website on the back of the contact card, and when you go to that link, you can request your body camera footage for the consent search. You can request your stop um, stop report, the level three stop report, and it gets expedited. So currently, I think we had 65 people uh, that requested it and they received it between one and seven days, which is the, the actual stop report with the explanation of why they were stopped. And then we put CCRB's number on our website, so when you hyperlink using the URL, their number is there as well, so they can individuals can report there. And then, like anything else, I mean, we this was rolled out in October uh, 19th of last year. So far, we only have one partial quarter posted. We want to take a look at what the numbers show us 
you know, as we roll out over a few quarters and see if we see any kind of patterns. We'll, we'll obviously coordinate with CCRB to see what they're seeing in terms of complaints. Are complaints across the board, across the city, are complaints isolated to certain precincts? Maybe the training needs to be focused. Maybe it needs to be refreshed around the department. But I think we took it with a, a level of seriousness uh, that it deserved. We, we rolled it out. We ensured that all of our officers were trained before the start date. And now we're monitoring to see what we need to do to make it better if we see any issues. So um, what precincts exactly were a part of the pilot program? Do you remember that? Oh, for, I think oh, it was the 40, oh gosh, the 75, the 9. I think it was the 40, the 45. Uh, yeah, that's right. So are we talking about the pilot program for the business cards? I believe it was the 4 the 4 the 7 and the 9 for the, for the How many of those were part of the, uh, uh, the um, federal monitorship, if any? Every precinct is under the federal monitorship. How many, how many of the original, <laughs> how, how many of those, I know we had two of the top five uh, precincts in terms of stop and frisk um, in Southeast Queens, as I said, in the 103 and the 113. They were specifically mentioned um, as, as part of the suit and as we went further into uh, negotiation with the federal monitor. Are any of those precincts involved? Were they any of those involved? Obviously not, um, if those are the ones that you mentioned. And, and how do we know specifically that those that were involved um, that corrective measures have been taken or that they specifically, that target audience, mm -hmm. they get it. So I, I, I want to clarify what this pilot was. This pilot wasn't required in law. It wasn't asked of us. We did it ourselves for one reason, to see if the training that we intended on doing department-wide for right-to-know training, if the officers actually if it was sufficient. And what we learned in the precincts that we did, and obviously we didn't do it in the precincts that you're talking about, in the four precincts where we did it, we recognized that there was confusion, that the officers were not clear on when they were obligated to give a contact card. And this is before the October 19th start date. This was early on. So we gave ourselves enough time to test it out to see if the training we were doing was sufficient, to test out how many cards should we expect to print for officers. And based on that, we realized that the training could have been better, and we improved the training for the department-wide training. So thank you for that. But are you saying that, that the understanding with, internally within the department there was that the universe was larger than those that were in directly involved in the federal monitorship or in the lawsuit? that led up to it um and so just to deal with those precincts it, it wasn't enough that that you you wanted to go outside of there and 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 make sure that you were addressing the entire universe of those that are going to come in contact and be a part of this uh as well which i think is a problem that we have not addressed specifically um those precincts that that had um, the greatest uh, amount of, of stops during the stop, question, and frisk. But then um, I, I want to talk about, again, uh, you talked about the working group and those that were involved in, in, in kind of developing and cultivating what this program would look like. Um, supervisors, managers, uh, the PBA, whom specifically was involved? So what we did was after after we did the pilot, we did a – so a, let's stick with the pilot for, for a moment, and then we'll expand out. We did focus groups with supervisors and with the cops. So when we tried it out, we gave them the training that we wanted to do department-wide. Then we sent them out into the field, and we saw, okay, what's the compliant – what it, you know, how are they complying with the directives that they received? After it was all over, I believe it was a 30-day pilot, we sat down with the cops, the rank and file, and then we sat down with their supervisors to get an understanding of what they believe they needed to do, 
you know, and where they may have been wrong, where they weren't wrong, and where they were right to see if, if there was a universal misunderstanding of what their obligations were. Aside from that, the plaintiffs in the federal monitorship, the federal monitor, um, we sat all, all be, we, there were stakeholders as part of the uh, federal litigation that were involved uh, early on that commented on the patrol guide procedures that we were doing. And then later in the process, about a, I think it was about a month before rollout, we sat down with other stakeholders with the recognition that it was, um, it was maybe a little too late to implement some of their suggestions, but with the promise that we were going to take their suggestions and try to implement the ones that we could. Um, in the subsequent revisions, which we committed to doing today. So, um, and by involving all that, those individuals that are involved, you think that you captured the best possible universe? Um, obviously, we, it wasn't 100%, but in, in terms of by involving the, and engaging the folks that were involved in the uh, focus group, was there any, anyone from outside of the department? So, yeah, the, I mean, I think the, the inside the department was the focus groups. Uh, outside the department was the federal monitor, the litigants in the stop, question, and frisk lawsuits, um, the uh, stakeholders that and, work and, with and the litigants. I'm talking about specifically on, during implementation. Um, yeah, that's what I'm and, talking and, about. And putting together, and putting together uh, uh, the rollout. And obviously, you had to roll out to the offices. The offices went out on the streets, and you came back and got feedback. Um, but prior to that, was anyone involved in actually uh, putting together, uh, helping to plan the rollout? I mean, I'm, I'm who, not. Who sure. did that? Was that was 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 that managers, upper management, supervision? I, I mean, on. Obviously, on that ultimate level, it would have to be supervision, and it would be supervisors and managers. But in order to get to that place, we're taking the input from the troops on the ground in order to develop a better policy. So, the like as I said, the the first the first approach was let's do roll call training. We realized from our troops on the ground that that's probably not going to be sufficient. We're going to need to do more. We worked with the litigants and the stakeholders and the federal monitor to embed because we needed to embed this training and, and this procedure into the patrol guide. That's At what directly, point did that occur? That was, uh, I mean, very early. In. Yes, so I think that the portion with the federal monitor and the plaintiffs was on the in-service trainings and the recruit trainings, and that was pretty early. I think we did that. We wanted to get that in place as early as possible, and the changes to 2.12.11 was pretty early. Um, and then when we met with other advocacy groups, that was relatively late, maybe a month, a few weeks before the implementation. And that's when Oleg said we would, some of the comments they had, we didn't have time to make changes for, but we're going to, on round two, I guess, make those changes. The pilot happened in April of 2018, and in order for us to get that going, we had to get approval from a lot of uh, the people in the, in the monitorship. So mm -hmm. a lot of uh, consultation right. happened prior to that. So we're satisfied that this process here allowed us to capture the, the greatest universe in terms, of, um, uh, in, in terms of the rollout, but making sure that um, we had the best understanding training uh, of the offices that were going to, to, to be involved. And what does that, I know you said that supervisors and, and, and individuals being promoted, um, does that mean everyone except for those who are sitting permanently behind the desk that are ultimately going to um, be trained in the role out here? I mean, Yes. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I think the, everybody's been trained. I mean, the goal, obviously, up front was the people that when you have, say everybody, who is everybody? Well, the department, un, the uniform, department. uniformed officers. But the, the, I mean, the way we staged it and the, the, the goal was... And supervisors, let, every supervisor. Yeah, yeah, and the goal was to train the individuals that have contact routinely with the public first to ensure that... Right. Right, and then... But, yeah, ultimately, everyone was trained. Yeah, and we, so we did. We created two videos um, that they had to view on MWPD and take a quiz on, and every uniformed officer from PO to chief had to... 
take that. Okay. Um, and then there's the what we're talking about the other training, and then there's a command level training. So, you know, this training sergeants were doing training to all the officers who are going out in the field, and then the in service training is the f- final piece that I think Ola was talking about, where sergeants, lieutenants, anyone promoted get it, anyone becoming plain clothes officers, all new recruits, and then. There is a massive in-service training for on all investigative encounters that every officer has to take, um, and we put it into that training, um, and that's ongoing as we speak. So let me just jump off that for a moment before I return it to the chair, and and and, and forgive me if you have uh, spoken on this already, but I wanted to talk about um, the last public report and the number of searches that were documented or that had been consented, and what were the findings on that? You have the data on that? Yeah, so it's, uh, we put it on our website. This is the fourth quarter of 2018. What we saw was that, uh, and this is a partial quarter, so it started, rollout started October 19th of 2018, so it captures the 19th through December 31st. So Mm -hmm. it's the partial quarter. We had 419 requests for consent to search, and out of those 419, 368 people consented to the search. So effectively, uh, 51 people refused consent. And And that's based on our protocol, the guidance that we developed pursuant to Councilmember Reynoso's bill where you know, we're asking in a manner that elicits knowing voluntarily and intelligent and, and, consent. And in and, and those instances, were there uh, any weapons or contraband? Found? Yeah, so we, I committed to uh, the council member before, before you came in that uh, we're going to, I'll get the number of uh, arrests that stemmed from that, and I will try to get the uh, recoveries, information on what we recovered from that. And the demographics? Uh, that's posted on the report. It's on, posted online. Age, gender, and race. And location? And precinct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Miller. Okay, I think we are finished here. We'll have some follow-up items for you. Um, but you get you get out just we're looking for that data is so, so critical out of those three, 368 stops and letting us uh, know, you know, that consent to searches is actually targeting the right people. Um, and we're going to, I think we've agreed to start to look at the disparities already in the way uh, the consent searches are, ha- are happening already. Uh, and then right to know uh, the cards, we'll talk a little bit more about level ones, but certainly want to have a further conversation uh, on level twos and level threes. Uh, so with that being said, thank you for coming today. Thank you. Alrighty, we now will have Jonathan Darsh from the Civilian Complaint Review Board. Alrighty, you may begin. Chair Richards, and members of the Public Safety Committee, member, uh, Council Member Miller, thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today. I'm Jonathan Darsh, Executive Director of the Civilian Complaint Review Board. As you know, the CCRB is responsible for investigating, mediating, and prosecuting allegations of excessive force, abuse of authority, discourtesy, and offensive language against members of the New York City Police Department. In advance of the Right to Know Act going into effect on October 19, 2018, we created new allegations and protocols to account for the additional types of misconduct implicated by the law and trained our investigations division on these new mechanisms. CCRB staff also worked with the Act's co-sponsors, Councilmember Antonio Reynoso and Councilmember Richie Torres, and the Council's Progressive Caucus to conduct a public education campaign. Our staff collaborated with advocates and partners to develop uh, Right to Know Act, Know Your Rights materials, 
and distributed thousands of flyers outside subway stations and schools and at street festivals throughout the five boroughs in coordination with street team efforts by council member Rivera, Menchaca, and Powers. As a result of the act and the CCRB's public education work, the agency has seen a 22% increase in complaints in the last six months compared with the same time frame last year. Included in that number are 192 complaints containing 322 allegations of a failure to receive a business card as required by the Right to Know Act. These metrics are publicly available on the CCRB's website via our Data Transparency Initiative, and we intend to report further on the impact of the Right to Know Act in our 2019 semi-annual and annual reports. I believe that the Right to Know Act plays an important role in police accountability in New York City, and that the public deserves to know as much about police disciplinary process as possible under the law. The CCRB is committed to its role in providing that transparency and to fair and impartial police oversight in the city of New York. I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. I'll start with the first one. Has the NYPD been forthcoming with documents that record a police officer's compliance with the Right to Know Act? Yes. So they've been forthcoming 100% of the time? So there are, there are incidents where we are not getting paperwork that we've requested but, or body-worn camera, body camera footage that we've requested, but generally speaking, they are cooperative. It's not, a, it, it's not a systemic problem so far. Okay. What does that mean? So out of how many, do you have a sample, a number you could, so is it there just maybe two cases where you haven't got out of 100 or? So are you talking about just with regard to the Right to mm -hmm. Know Act? Or mm -hmm. I, we'd have to get you that number. I just don't have it in front of me, but I'll get it for you. So you said they have been compliant when, it, when it's come to the Right to Know Act. So it's not specific that they're not giving us Right to Know Act information. They're, it is- I know hundreds of different, right, I get it, okay. Have there been any instances where you're learning through investigation that there are violations of the Right to Know Act? So right now, we've, it's, it's a very short amount of time that the Right to Know Act has been in effect with regard to our investigations. So uh, if you look at refusal to provide name allegations, uh, there have been 150 such allegations since the Right to Know Act went into effect, and we've only uh, been able to close one of those allegations so far on the merits uh, and that was unfounded by body-worn camera footage. Uh, and that, that case also had a, uh, a refusal to give shield number allegation associated with it, and that allegation was also unfounded, mostly due to the body-worn camera footage we received on that case. Uh, and shouldn't they all, all these encounters be on body one cameras um, unless they? so the we encourage if you people if you feel that you've been uh the victim of misconduct by someone not following the the right to know act to make a complaint with the ccrb but not everyone who makes a complaint was entitled to a card under the right to know act and so it may have been that the person had an encounter with the police. They wanted, they, they thought they were entitled to a card. They did not ask for a card and they did not get a card. So in that case, they, there would have been no obligation to record it. Right, and, and just go through, you said out of 150 cases, you received 150 complaints. We've re received 150 allegations. allegations. Some of those might have more than one. Uh, there, some of those allegations, there might be more than one of them in a particular complaint. For example, if uh, I was walking down the street and I encountered three members of service who stopped me, I might allege that all of them should have given me a card or all of them should have told me my, their name. Um. What are you able to do with the information on a lack of compliance with the right to know? Could you, could you be more specific, Mr. Counsel? So Mr. does Chair? the lack of obtaining consent rise to the level of misconduct when you investigate? 
So if a, if a member of service conducts a search and we were able to determine that they were relying on consent to do that search, uh, but we don't feel that that consent was properly obtained, we would substantiate that allegation. The burden of proof that the agency has is, uh, be, uh, is a preponderance of the evidence. Right. And then um, what, so give me a, a scenario, what level of discipline would CCRB then recommend to the commissioner on something like this? So the, the factors that we take into account when the board is recommending discipline are the allegation uh, that has been substantiated, the member of services disciplinary history and rank within the department, and then just the totality of the circumstances. So uh, if, if the member of service who has a, if, if the allegation is failure to give a business card upon request and the officer has uh, no disciplinary history and is a relatively low tenure, uh, and there's nothing else remarkable about the case, it is likely that that member of service, we would recommend training. If we're talking about a search of a person or search of a home, uh, and, or, if the or if the subject officer is a, of a longer tenure and higher rank, it is more likely that there'll be more serious discipline recommended, such as a command discipline or even charges, especially if we're talking about search of a home. Right, and let's move from consent on business cards to you. Is it similar, or what are your thoughts around uh, handing out business cards as well if, if uh, an officer doesn't supply a, a business card? So the agency treats failure to give a business card as a fatal allegation, as abuse of authority. And you spoke of an increase uh, specifically, I think, in your testimony. Uh, you stated there's been a 22% increase in complaints in the last six months, and that's attributed to, you're attributing that to right to now? So it, we, we can't attribute it to anything in particular, but we, and this is, this is my you're just belief. Saying, or you're just saying this is, there's been a 22% increase and what we know has changed in the last six months has been the implementation of the Right to Know Act and the public education work that the agency's outreach unit did in conjunction with many city council members. And frankly, a lot of staff members, not just from the outreach unit, chipped in to help with that uh, outreach work. And, and go through your, your outreach work. And I'm very appreciative of the work you're, you're doing in our district. But what does a, a Right to Know Act campaign look like? right now? Are you working with stakeholders and local communities to get the word out? Are we positive that everyday New Yorkers know that uh, they have the right to know? So I, I think there, those are two separate questions. I know that my staff has been working very hard in conjunction with uh, stakeholder groups and with members of the council to make sure that as many people know about the Right to Know Act as possible. But uh, from what I have heard from advocates and from, uh, you know, from people in meetings that it is not as well known as it needs to be. What can we do as a council or as a city or as an administration to ensure that the public uh, knows that these laws are actually in effect? Does it mean more money? Do you need, to, I mean, I'm sure agency will take more money. I don't know any agency that won't. Um, but but what could we do to make sure we get the word out a little bit more? Can you go through some examples of some campaigns that CCRB is doing at the moment? So I'll, I'll mm -hmm. yes, we would take more money if the council gave us more money. Uh, but the, the our outreach unit really works very hard to go to uh, schools, go to after school centers, uh, go to community groups, go to libraries, where there are people gathering, uh, the CCR outreach teams will be there trying to make sure that people know uh, 
not just about the Right to Know Act, but about the CCRB and that we're here to take their complaints, investigate them, mediate them if they so choose. And if there's uh, misconduct that's been substantiated and charges are recommended, prosecute those cases. Uh, how big is your outreach team? Uh, we have a director and five uh, outreach coordinators. And I'm assuming there are some challenges, just as my office has challenges with reaching a, a, a larger universe. I mean, we do what we can do with what we have, right? Um, but if you're talking about 10 million New Yorkers, how does six people reach those? Into, six it's, people reach 10 million people. It's very, very difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that our uh, that our policy unit and communications team do. Uh, I was talking about the data transparency initiative. We try and make as much material available online as possible, but without uh, it, it, it's difficult to do those type of outreach effort uh, that would really make the the public aware of the Right to Know Act and of the CCRB with with the resources we have. So I, I, offline, I think we should speak about maybe a campaign day around Right to Know, something of that nature, probably partner with the Black Latino Asian Caucus of the Council as well. But there has to be ways for us to work collectively to really get the word out. Maybe it's us tweeting a day. You know, I mean, there's a variation of things that we could all do to make sure that we get the word out there, especially in communities that largely are communities that are used to being targeted with, with stop and frisk. It's a great idea, Mr. Chair. So I think there, there's more. Is there anything else we could do to strengthen uh, outreach efforts here? I, I think that's a great start. And uh, I'm looking at my uh, director of outreach and uh, intergovernmental affairs, and I can tell she's already excited uh, to put something like that together. That's excitement, right, Yahara? Yes, yes. She's saying that because her boss is here. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there, I would have said yes too. Um, uh, are there problems with the law that make it hard for, for implementation or make it harder to, to track or substantiate cases? Or do, are there any changes you would recommend to us at the council? So we are very careful to conduct fair and impartial investigations. That's the political answer. No, but. Okay. Um, <laughs> So we try not to suggest uh, and ask leading questions in initial interviews so that we don't put into someone's mind that uh, they should complain about something that didn't happen. And so making sure that our investigators are trained and aware of the Right to Know Act so that they ask the questions that will lead us to get information that lets us judge whether the Right to Know Act sh should should. Uh, whether it applies and whether it was violated, the, you know, we've, we feel like we're good at it, but we need to do, we need to keep reviewing it and making sure that our people are, are on top of it. And I understand that you have to somewhat be impartial, but I'm assuming your investigators would know based on, and they've all been trained in what to look for here, correct? Correct, but, you know, it, it is still new, and it's not something that we've been doing for a right. long, long time. So we need to make sure that our people are asking the right questions. Right. So we have a robust quality assurance effort to make sure that those questions are being asked and, and, uh, and so that's what we've been doing to make sure that uh, we are doing our job as the main uh, avenue for oversight of the NYPD, especially for civilians who have individual complaints that they're making, uh, that their cases are fairly heard. Okay. And I don't want to go in circles, but you said only one case so far was substantiated out of 150. And those 150 but that, but that's, were a variation of different complaints? So that's, that is uh, because there's a long process involved. So those aren't 150 cases that are closed. No, I get That's that. 150 cases we've received since October, and we've only had one substantiated case out of that 150. But that's because we have, we have still have a lot more, 
those cases are still in the and when do we in anticipate the we'll make progress which i know each case is different on the 149 law so I, I i would like to think that certainly by the end of this year those those cases would be resolved and we could accurately report to you on what the disposition of those cases were and, uh, and, just, and forgive me today it's been a long weekend out of those 149 those were right to know specific violations so the uh, in my in my testimony I referenced 192 complaints containing 322 allegations of failure to receive a business card as required Wait, by the say that again how many 300 22 allegations allegations failure to, to receive a business card and that was and those complaints were just specifically on that correct okay. because those are the ones that I can tell you are definitely related to the right to know act whereas someone just complaining that they were searched improperly they might not have realized that that right was even implement implicated by the right to know act but we're still investigating it at the early stages of a case we don't we don't hold a civilian responsible for knowing the law that much so if you just think that you were treated badly call the CCRB tell us what happened and then we can evaluate the case so it may be that the person wasn't searched pursuant to a consent search it may have been that they were searched uh, their home was entered and searched pursuant to a search warrant or the police made an arrest and they made a search incident to that arrest and so there are different analyses that then follow and so they wouldn't necessarily implicate the right to know act and until the cases are completed and we are able to have the board review them and have our policy staff review it it becomes difficult for us to tell you whether the right to know act was implicated or not and uh, in CCRB I'm assuming you need more staff being that you're starting to see these these increases are you projecting a need for more resources here so we've been working with uh, the office management and budget they are understanding our uh, that the caseloads have gone up and that are not just the complaints but the caseloads of individual investigators from this work and they're monitoring the situation along with us and they've promised us that it, you know that they take these caseloads very seriously and they'll get us the resources we need should the trend continue. And uh, the NYPD out of these 300 cases, uh, allegations, I'm sorry, um, they've been compliant or forthcoming with information to you in these cases? So, so if there are issues, it's with an individual case and it's not systemic and I can get back to you on that. I just. There may be a case or two where someone has made a request and it has not been complied with as fast as we would like, but that doesn't mean that there's not a general willingness on the part of the department to share information. And I mentioned earlier uh, about the 311 complaints being forwarded to CCRB. Are you finding 311 gets you those complaints or are you finding gaps in the 311 system? So we've been working hard with the 311 team since the right to know act was first passed we've given them new scripts we've worked with them on implementing those new scripts uh, so that uh, when people do call we're getting their complaints and so far we think it's working but we are monitoring the situation and we're going to work with the uh, 311 folks to make sure that we are getting all of the complaints how do you work with 311 to make sure you're getting so uh, our policy unit and the investigations division have been working with 311 to make sure that their people are trained when they get certain questions or when they're asking questions to use the scripts that we give them and that we've worked with them to develop to make sure that uh, we get those cases. And, 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 there, and in these scenarios, are these cases being forwarded to the NYPD directly? So, I'm not aware of any. But that doesn't mean that it hasn't occurred. But I, I'm confident that we, the work we have done has made sure that the vast majority of them are coming to us. Okay, I'm going to go to Councilmember Miller for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. 
So just a, a few brief questions. Um, when when the uh, NYPD was, was testifying previously, they talked about the collaboration collaborations with CCRB. Um, could you elaborate on that in terms of? Um, I think that you somehow you guys had a part was part of the focus group or played a role in, in the focus group, but more importantly, in terms of after the rollout, um, ha what kind of role are you then playing on oversight of, of uh, Right to Know? So I, I think our most important role uh, with regard to cooperating with the department came after passage and before implementation is that we worked with the department and advocates to make sure that the literature we were giving out to people and the information we were giving to, uh, to the residents of this city was accurate. And uh, there was, I think we, in that case, we were a bridge between uh, advocacy groups and the department and, and where it, we were able to explain to the department why some of the things they they thought uh, issues they had with the, the implementation of the bill didn't seem to me to the CCRB to be borne out by the language of the legislation and so and I couldn't I know that we worked hard to make sure that everyone agreed that the information we were handing out was accurate. I forget exactly what the issues were. There were two or three issues with our that we kept going back and forth to make sure that the literature was accurate. I forget what they were now. I could go back and And, find and out of the, the over 300 uh, complaints, has there been any subsequent conversation about the legislation, about the rollout and implementation of a rollout uh, of the legislation um, by the NYPD, um, ha has that, have they engaged CCRB in any shape, form, or fashion as to um, what the complaints were and feedback as to what could be done differently or some of the things that you were talking about in terms of whether or not there was a direct uh, uh, correlation between policy, policy rollout, and what you guys were seeing? Yes. So it's important for the CCRB to, when they're finding someone is guilty of misconduct, or when they're substantiating allegations of misconduct, to, to take into account how officers are trained. And so if there's an inconsistency between the legislation and how it and how it is being trained to officers about how to implement the legislation, uh, it becomes difficult to substantiate misconduct because the officers think they're following what they're supposed to be following. And so working with the department on, on issues like that uh, is paramount. It's not something we do just in the Right to Know Act. We do that. Uh, it's something we do regularly. So, so, so not just in the areas of where complaints have been substantiated, but in those gray areas where you, where you, you're really taking a look at it. But at the end of the day, is it is the lack of training on this end, or but at the end of the day, something happened, and and, and may not rise to the level of uh, a discipline, um, but the fact is that something happened, and and that it is beyond the intent of the, of, of, of the policy, of the law. And um, while we are not recommending, uh, we have not found conclusively that this person was in a violation, but this is something that we really need to take a look at. Are you taking a look at those and suggesting to the department that this is really great potentially yeah. leads to something else. Yes. One of the uh, you know, in, in, Inspector Cosgrove, who was testifying earlier and is the commanding officer of risk management, 
one of the earliest conversations I had with him when he first became, I think, I think I became executive director after he became CEO of risk management. So, or it was, it was around the, the same time. One of my earliest conversations with him was about how just because the CCRB is exonerating conduct doesn't mean that it is good police work. And so, uh, going, you know, that having that uh, lines of communication open between the risk management uh, unit and the CCRB is very important. So we can go to them with issues, uh, not just with Right to Know Act, but generally go to them with issues and say, this is something where we've seen and we think it's something you need to look at. That is kind of precisely what I, what, what I was getting at and, and that uh, obviously CCRB to maintain its integrity so that the credibility is there, that they can receive it in a way that it should be received is, is very important. Um, I want to get back to one of the things the, the chair was talking about earlier, and that is how do we reach our target audience and, and whether or not there seems to be a discrepancy over the eight and a half million New Yorkers as opposed to specifically those communities of color, those precincts that are serving, and specifically those precincts that were involved in the lawsuits and the initial uh, federal monitoring. And that is not, that, that's a handful, less than 10. And so have we identified those, again, 103s, 113, to, to, to make sure that um, they're specifically in compliance? Because otherwise we're, we're kind of saying that the problem was, was much, much greater than those five or six precincts that had been identified in the lawsuit and beyond, and, and are we specifically reaching that target audience um, in a way, again, that we can bring back to the community, the constituents saying that here's what's being done, um, not just from an NYPD perspective, from a CCRB perspective. Here's the things that are being done to make sure that the services are being delivered with the integrity and respect that they deserve. But at the same time, um, if there is... Uh, that there's this vehicle, there's, there's this specific vehicle uh, that the, the uh, constituency has available to them, right to know, that you should be utilizing this. So I'm going to address two of the issues that you brought up in that question separately, if that's okay with you, Councilman. The first is the pilot program. Uh, and the pilot program that I'm aware of was uh, is, was ordered by uh, Judge Torres in the implementation phase of the Floyd litigation. And uh, it set up a, a rather, uh, depending on your perspective, either robust or complicated process for evaluating whether uh, it was feasible to require business cards to be given out uh, in level two and level one uh, encounters. The, the agency is a stakeholder in the Floyd litigation because the CCRB is responsible for making sure that officers are uh, properly in carrying out the law, whether it's the Fourth Amendment or New York State law or the Right to Know Act. Uh, and while we are a stakeholder generally, we have not been engaged in the negotiations uh, that uh, Mr. Chernofsky was, was describing, where it's negotiations between the NYPD, the monitor, and the plaintiff's lawyers. But we have been keeping in touch with risk management specifically to make sure that when the pilot program begins, we are aware of it so we can hold officers responsible for, who, who are participating in the pilot program, responsible for the requirements of the pilot program. 
but I think there was a second second part yeah, to your question. Target uh, specific those uh, those targeted uh, audiences. Those those because I I think again if if we're saying if if we have a pilot program does not, which does not specifically include the precincts that were directly involved in the lawsuit, um, in the conversations, in the overall conversations that, that we were because our communities was involved with the judge, then we then we are looking at a much wider problem if if if, if that is the case. I'm hoping that, that that is not the case and I'm more concerned about uh, the fact that we did not have outreach in Southeast Queens. Um, how do we move forward? And one of my one of my concerns going in was kind of the the, the confusion of of right to consent, the, and 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 the right to know, and and whether or not we were creating an environment that. Um, kind of falsely armed folks with with information or law that, you know, if, if, if ultimately if, if they want to search you, they're going to search you, and there's, there's going to be cause to search you, and, and what happens in between, right? So I, I think understanding the rules of engagement is what's most important here, right? And, and how do we make that happen? How, how do we then... Um, reach our target audience, and I know that you have an outreach team, and I like the chair, uh, uh, certainly making ourselves available, and we do events every week, multiple times, um, and I know that they've been out to talk to community boards and so forth, but I have not seen uh, any specific dialogue, specifically around right to know, just the role of CCRB, and, and kind of reintroducing themselves. But this specifically is something that is, is vitally important and is impact. And then finally, um, if we're not dealing with, with level ones and twos, that's, that's really where these encounters and the culture and, and the environment of community and police relationships, that's really where it happens. And I think Chair, yeah, that that we we're, we're really missing the boat if if that happens. Obviously, if you get into a more serious crime, that that leaves the opportunity for things to happen, and and there's all sorts of investigations that happen anyway because of that. But just in these low-level incidental encounters that undermine the integrity of communities. And people just keep going, right? You, let, let me just say this. Where you get pulled over, where families get pulled over, right? And and husbands and wives and children are taken out of the car. The car is tossed and nothing happens. They get back in and you don't know what happened. And you call the priest and they go, nah, that wasn't one of our guys, mm-hmm. right? Those are the things that, that really, really undermine the the a community, the integrity and the fabric of the community, and are we missing something there? Is there a way that this doesn't, but there's something else that, that we can do here to make sure that that this tool that has been created addresses that? So I think uh, the tool that addresses that is the CCRB itself. And so I don't, I think it's important not to let people know, I think it's important to let people know what their rights are under the Right to Know Act, but the most important thing is that people know if you feel that you have been the victim of police misconduct, you should call the CCRB. Calling the precinct, it might be a legitimate answer that it wasn't one of ours, it was a different command, or it was a different unit, it was a gang unit or narcotics unit, but my, the CCRB, our investigators, even if you don't know who the officer was, we'll find out. We're very good at identifying who the officers are. And we, it is important that, that if we don't have a complaint, uh, we can't investigate. And so one of the – you're correct. When our people are going out in the field, we are not necessarily doing specific 
right to know act only uh, education because to do that without telling people about the CCRB and our process and how to file a complaint, it's meaningless. It, unless people know to call us if they have a problem, if you're calling the, the precinct, then you, you shouldn't be. You should be calling the CCRB. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And I do want to thank them because I think you did your CCRB. I think there was something I did with you in Rosedale. I came by. And Indeed. That was a really good meeting because it wasn't necessarily the regulars, but more of that uh, would be helpful. And that's a staffing question, right? Like you can only be in one place at one time. And one of the things that we've been doing this year is we've been trying to focus on uh, public housing to do our uh, to do our monthly meetings in in every other meeting we've been going into different uh, housing uh, facilities across the the city and uh, I think we're going to be uptown in in May and uh, I encourage people to come to our public meetings and and uh, participate and give your testimony to us so it's it's another avenue to let New Yorkers participate in the system and tell us how they feel about what what is going on with policing in their community. Okay, two last questions. Uh, one, uh, in your testimony, I noted you skipped the round of legislation. Do you support the legislation? The, uh, the, the, the bill, the proposed bill. So we support the goals of the legislation and okay. in, in making sure that uh, the council and the public have as much information about Right to Know Act implementation as possible. Just as in the truncation bill, we worked with you and, and to make sure it was as, uh, that the, the legislation would accomplish your goals and not burden the agency. I think right we, we have work to do uh, offline, as it, as it were, with your staff and my staff to make sure that we can accomplish the same goals okay. with the, the proposed legislation. So you support it, don't support it? We support the goals, but the way it's written okay. now would be very difficult to implement. Okay. And just go through what's difficult, what would be difficult? So right now, because there have been so few cases that have gone through, we're able to look at all of them and, and we can break down the different uh, okay. items that are in the legislation but if you're going to do it on a yearly or semi-annual basis okay. it would be it would be much much more difficult and so in order to uh, in order to accomplish the goals of getting the council and the public the information that you need I think the bill needs to be tweaked okay uh, and then on uh, just one last thing on um, have you received any complaints on um, people not knowing that they had a right to to not voluntary to voluntary consent. Yes. Okay. Um, So as I was describing earlier, it's tough to know the exact number of uh, cases that we've received right now that implicate that because until we've gone through all of the investigative process, we don't know if it was in fact a consent search that was implicated. But right now we're seeing uh, approximately seven complaints that have uh, at least one improper search that was based on a a consent search okay all right so we're gonna get through all those cases yes sir <laughs> okay all right I want to thank you for coming in today thank you mr. Thank chair you. thank you for the council to work together Lord. thank you all righty we're gonna call up uh, Kaylin Greer, Girls for Gender Equity, Anthony Posada, Legal Aid Society, and Michael Szyzyski, New York City, City Liberal Liberties Union, and also Victoria da Davis from the Justice Committee, and Deron Small. Take care.
Baby Justice or Victoria? Which one? <laughs> we better go. Yeah, no, Victoria has to go, but the, you may want the baby to go first. Oh, okay. <laughs> hi, baby. Say hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I'll start. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Victoria Davis. I'm the sister of Delron Small, who was killed by NYPD officer Wayne Isaacs on July 4th, 2016. I'm also a member of the Justice Committee, a grassroots organization that fought alongside many other groups to pass the Rights to Know Act, and a Bronx community member who has experienced a Rights to Know Act violation. This year, on February 20, 27th, I was welcomed He's ready to go. Yes. <laughs> no, I'm saying he's an activist already. He's ready to go. He's, yeah. He's, no, he's grabbing that mic. He's ready to speak. You, you want to you tell right. him about the, the encounter? He wants to tell you about the right. encounter. He was right. there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we were walking down the street in our community um, when I saw an elderly woman lying on the sidewalk on West Burnside Avenue. Hmm? Oh. Mm. On West Burnside Avenue <sighs> with blood gushing out of her head. I stopped to try to help, and a lot of the other community members rushed to help to attempt to aid her as well. Some called 911, others looked around for people who knew her. One community member took off her T-shirt and used it to apply pressure to the, to the elderly woman's head. At, one, at that point, an NYPD car from the 46th Precinct arrived, and two uniformed officers got out rather than rushing to the elders' aid. They stood on the sidewalk and watched while community members were trying to figure out how to help her. I approached the officers and told them they should help the, wo the woman. They paid very little attention to me and did very little to assist her. At this point, a second NYPD car arrived and two other officers got out. One was in a regular uniform and the other was in a white, a white shirt. I asked the uniformed officer who, appear who appeared I asked the uniform officer if they were going to help the elderly woman because her head was still bleeding and only the people of the community were helping. He did not respond. He smirked and laughed. Because of this, I requested his business card, which I know um, I have the right to do because of the Rights to Know Act. And actually, that's what I had told him. Um, rather than produce his card, he said, what card? In a sarcastic tone. I then asked again. He handed me a blank card. It had lines. Actually, I have the card with me. Um, it had lines on it for the officer's rank, name, shield number, and other identifying information on one side, but they were not filled in. I asked him to fill out the card, and he refused, telling me I could fill it out myself in a rude tone. I asked him several times to fill out the card, but he continued to refuse. When I asked him outright for his name and badge number, he ignored me. This was a clear violation of the Rights to Know Act. I felt completely disrespected, and the officer who I was interacted with, interacting with clearly had absolutely no respect for the Rights to Know Act protocols. For this to happen in the midst of an elderly is that for me? Oh, in, in the midst of an elderly woman bleeding, bleeding profusely on the ground. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that, like, I highlighted there are other members of the Justice Committee who have witnessed Rights to Know Act violations as well. For example, in Jackson Heights, our members have witnessed multiple stops of street vendors during which officers do not give their name, rank, and command at the start of the interaction. In the Bronx, we have also seen officers stop people for alleged fear evasions and not identify themselves. Because of the Justice Committee's experience working in neighborhoods with large immigrant communities, I also want to raise a concern about language access. Time and time again, Justice Committee members who are trained to cop watch have witnessed incidents in which NYPD officers stop community members who are not comfortable with English. Never once have we seen officers use the language line that is available to them. Almost every single time, the officers have stopped non-primary English speakers that our, our members have either witnessed or personally experienced. Officers simp um, simply speak, talk, to, talk at them, talk at the community member, uh, the target, I'm sorry, that, um, at, the, at the community member. 
in English without caring whether or not the person understood what they were saying or being asked of. This raises serious questions for us when it comes to the implementation of the Rights to Know Act and especially the consent to search law. If members of the community have no idea what officers are saying to them, how can they give informed consent to a, a search? We have no way of knowing how many of the so-called consent, consent to searches the NYPD has conducted since October 2019 were searches of New Yorkers who don't fully understand English or if the officers involved follow language access guidelines. Uh, let's see. I just, I'll close out. Let's run out of time a little. Um, I just want to say all of this to say there's clearly a lot of work to do and we're calling on the city council to make it, to make sure that it gets done. The NYPD is not implementing the rights to no acting adequately, adequately in some cases, well, in a lot of cases. As with my experience, officers are flat out disrespecting the laws, the people they're intending, they're interacting with, and uh, the broader community. On top of taking action to ensure the Rights to Know Act laws are fully implemented, the City Council also has the responsibility to enact additional laws to fill in the gaps to take greater steps towards ensuring police accountability and transparency. And thank you. Thank you, Ms. Victoria. So good afternoon. I want to thank the committee and you, Chairperson, Richards for holding this very important hearing and you have my testimony and I will just highlight some important portions of the testimony and address some of the things that were mentioned by the NYPD uh, when they testified. And I just thought, want to start off with this. In our work in the Community Justice Unit across New York City, we provide a number of Know Your Rights workshops on police encounters and always talk about the Right to Know Act since its passage. And what we find across the board is that the majority of community members do not know what their rights are. That's, that's the baseline that we need to start with and operate with. And, and when I, after I say that, I just want to mention, walk you through a scenario that is a common textbook scenario where we see that the Right to Know Act is not being implemented. So a group of youth are in a park or in a corner. Uh, a police officer smells marijuana or the odor of marijuana and approaches that group of, of youth. At that point in time, that is now a, a level two encounter, right? That officer feels that he or she has founded suspicion of criminality. And no youth that we have encountered in all of the workshops that we have done have told us that police officers have given their business cards when being encountered by police officers in this exact scenario. So when the officer is approaching them to ask that pointed question of, uh, what's happening, who's smoking marijuana, and to start to see what, the, what he or she can find out. None of them have been given a, a, a Right to Know Act business card with the name of the officer that's conducting this kind of questioning. And we all know that police officers use deception when they're engaging in these encounters to see if there's some incriminating information that comes out of this. And let's say that this escalates to a, a level three stop now and the officer at that point is supposed to ask for their consent to search and activate their body worn camera. Well, that's not what we're seeing. And here I wanna just mention that there's a huge interplay and interconnection between the right to know act and body worn cameras in that the video footage that we have received after months of, of requesting for it and, and demanding it not as easy as uh, it was mentioned by the NYPD, shows that by the time that the cameras are activated, the search has already occurred, or the officers have already uh, begun to extract from the bag or from a vehicle the thing that they are gonna, now gonna accuse our clients with. So there's never any activation of the camera at the point of questioning or at the point of asking the person for their voluntary and knowing consent. So when both of those things are not happening, it is our position that the NYPD cannot say with any confidence that they are implementing the Right to Know Act or that the spirit or, or intent of the Right to Know Act is being followed. In addition to that, let's, we can switch that scenario of the, of the odor of marijuana and use it to say when youth are being asked if they are part of a gang, 
right? No, nothing uh, has given rise to the officer other than the f of how they're dressed or, or if they have scars or tattoos. And if the officer begins to ask those pointed questions, he or she should be providing those youth with their business card to let them know why they're being stopped. But that's not even happening. And we're seeing this, and especially in the community of Corona with the recent shooting on the subway platform, that there has been a heightened police presence in that area. This is what police officers have been doing, and, and the youth are not being given business cards. And especially youth who, let's say they do not even speak English, are, are further marginalized and not even being told what is it that's occurring. And something that was mentioned earlier of uh, was that crime is down, and, and that's a good thing for all of us, but the fact that crime is down does not mean that interactions have also been going down with police officers, or, or that the fact that they are being, that they're not reporting. Um, also, the court is not an adequate measure or mechanism in which to determine uh, the whether the stop was one that was lawful or if the uh, police provided the knowing voluntary consent request or if they give out their business card because a lot of cases, if not 90% of them, are resolved through pleas and many of them at, a, at the arrangement stage. So at a stage where there hasn't been any suppression hearing, there hasn't been any opportunity to question how the stop took place or the behaviors of the officer. So just wanted to make sure that that was highlighted. And something also to, to bring the attention to the committee is that at, and as written into the patrol guide, at a level two encounter, officers may, may request consent to search, right? And many of them are asking for it. I mean, not asking for it, but many of them are engaging in consent searches at level two stops. So it's not just solely a matter of level three encounters that we need to focus on. And it is unfortunate, as was mentioned by other uh, committee members that level ones and level twos are not being reported because that is the bulk of where police interactions are occurring. Also, just bringing your attention to the patrol guide again for with respect to level three, the language as is written, uh, when you look at point 25, says you may request consent to search, right? So there's not, the, even the language is not one that is directing officers to make sure that this, that they have to do this, but rather kind of leaves it open for their own discretion uh, to engage in that. So it's, that's very problematic as well. And I just wanted to point out that in our, also in our recent work and litigation representing e-bike uh, delivery, food delivery workers, uh, we, are, we have not met a single one of them who has received a business card from police interactions uh, in, in when they're getting stopped and as well as searched by police officers in these cases. Lastly, uh, something that we did want to point out and that I elaborate further in the testimony is that the right to no act should encompass DNA searches. DNA searches uh, when youth, uh, juveniles, or other community members are being brought over to the precinct and buccal swabs are taken from them, this carries heavy consequences. This is a form of racially biased policing. This goes into a permanent data bank and people are not being told that they have a right to not consent to that DNA swab being taken from them. When, if this was a case that was in court, the prosecutors would have to have submitted a motion and get a court order to uh, have our clients submit to an actual DNA. If, if the client has not uh, pled out to a, to a right, has not taken an actual plea, in which case that's a different requirement. But out of somebody's own voluntary consent, just taking people's DNA is a matter that should be one where they are informed of what's happening and that their consent should be taken as a result of that. So that, that's just something that we do want to highlight. And I know if, if the committee has a hearing coming up on that, then that's great to explore that. But just wanted to make sure that in this space that was highlighted and mentioned. And lastly, there's a, there's a few client stories that are, are written into the testimony, but I will just elevate one that, that is really uh, common that we see a lot, is, is has to do with the Right to Know Act as it relates to car stops. So our client MS is a credible messenger violence interrupter from Far Rockaway. MS was driving his car with two other violence interrupters and he was pulled over for no other reason than driving while black. MS was asked to stop out of the vehicle along with all the other people in the car and they were all asked pointed questions about what they were doing and what was happening. MS demanded to know the reason for being stopped but the police officers refused to answer any questions. The police then searched the car and then told MS that he was free to go. 
The police never activated their body-worn cameras, they never provided a business card, and they also never asked for their knowing and voluntary consent. So that, just that Klein story alone triggers all the different ways in which the Right to Know Act was violated and the way in which there was non-compliance. So again, we, we support this introduction that the council is, is putting forward, that this committee has today, but it would suggest that the council actually demand that the police follow and take seriously the Right to Know Act, that they actually implement it, and that they also consider including DNA searches as something that should be complying with the Right to Know Act as well. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Committee Chair Richards. My name is Kylan Greer, and I am the Policy Manager at Girls for Gender Equity. GGE is a Brooklyn-based intergenerational organization working to combat widespread gender-based and racialized violence that young people of color experience. Through direct service and advocacy, advocacy and culture change, GGE brings young people into the broader intersectional multiracial movement to end gender-based violence by ensuring that the most impacted voices are heard and their solutions enacted. Thank you for holding this important hearing today. The full implementation of the Right to Know Act is urgent for cis cisgender and transgender women and gender nonconforming young people who regularly experience discriminatory interactions with police as they play outside, walk to and from school, and live their everyday lives. When cis and trans women and GNC young people are stopped, these interactions can be really traumatizing and frequently dehumanizing and can include sexual harassment and sexual violence. These interactions often criminalize young people and can lead to unnecessary arrests that have collateral consequences for mental health, families, work, and school. In this Me Too movement moment, armed police officers identifying themselves to community members and gaining inf informed and voluntary consent to search individuals are a bare minimum. We call on the New York, New York to Police, Police Department to fully implement the full spirit and letter of the law. I want to uplift two stories shared by young women we serve at GGE. First, three young women of color, all 18 years old and younger, headed to the train station after our programming. As there frequently is, there, are not, there was an officer standing outside the turnstile of the MTA station. Despite using the metro cards that Gigi gives out after program, the officer followed these three young women. The officer intentionally waited for the group to separate before he followed a young woman, now alone, to hassle her, claiming she jumped the turnstile. I really want to emphasize the tactic that a gun-carrying older adult male officer waited until a young woman was alone, a moment where she was less able to defend herself as the moment to intimidate and attempt to criminalize her. Another young woman in our programming shared that, she, that recently one of the NYPD school safety agents in her school repeatedly sexually harassed her, abusing his authority multiple times, asking for her number. Let's be clear, this is school personnel that she has to see every day. If she avoids school in an effort not to be sexualized by an adult, then she is vulnerable to truancy charges, which fall within the Right to Know Act jurisdiction. She is caught in a double bind with limited recourse. These interactions are just the tip of the iceberg, and they, do, they are so frequent that they are almost normalized by young people. As an organizational member of the Right to Know Act Co Coalition, we met with the NYPD to learn about how they are beginning to implement the law. At no point prior to the departments of the roll rollout of their piloted trainings did they take any recommendations that impact, impacted communities made. After reading the NYPD patrol guide changes, it's clear that the implementation of the Right to Know Act is not occurring to the extent mandated by the law. The law states that an, if an officer must obtain voluntary, knowing, and intelligent consent by directly informing people of their right to decline a search, and by clearly asking whether someone understands that they have the right to decline a search. None of these mandates are made clear in the NYPD patrol guide. DG also supports Councilmember Reynoso's bill, T201, you know the bill number, <laughs> 4052, um, introduced by Councilmember Reynoso, requiring that the NY NYPD report on declined searches. This legislation supports the vision for the 
for NYPD transparency that the existing Right to Know Act was founded on. Reporting on declined searches is imperative so that we know that the option to, de to a declined search is being upheld by the NYPD. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Michael Sazitsky, lead policy counsel with the New York Civil Liberties Union. The Right to Know Act has been a key priority for the NYCLU for years, uh, so we'd like to thank the committee and Chair Richards for convening this hearing today. Um, you know, based on the updates to the patrol guide, uh, that some of which were discussed earlier, and the limited data that's currently come out on consent searches, the NYCLU has serious concerns about how the NYPD went about implementing the laws. Um, and a key reason that uh, so much of what went into the patrol guide the NYPD got wrong was how they went about developing that guidance. So we heard a little earlier during the NYPD panel about what their process and timeline looked like for getting input from advocates and community members. Um, and it was very telling the uh, approach that they took. Uh, so the consent to search law, uh, now local law 56, uh, it starts off by expressing the council's very clear intent that the guidance for consent searches be developed with input from the community. The NYPD, uh, as I acknowledged earlier, chose to interpret community to mean the plaintiffs in ongoing litigation. Um, plaintiffs who would be subject to confidentiality, not be able to fully dis or publicly discuss a lot of the details that were being uh, sent back and forth between them and the NYPD. And litigators who are subject to confidentiality restrictions are not a substitute for engagement with communities that are directly impacted by NYPD policies. And so the unsurprising result of that was that the uh, patrol guide provisions that they developed were really lacking in context. Um, they omitted uh, some of the clear requirements of the law. Um, or misstated some of the exceptions. Um, and when the NYPD did meet with the advocates who had actually worked on the Right to Know Act, it was in maybe three, four weeks before the laws uh, took full effect. And it was made very clear in that meeting that any substantive changes were off the table before the laws would be implemented. So what we saw were uh, uh, omissions like language access. Um, I was, it was good to hear the NYPD earlier say that they view uh, putting in language access uh, provisions into the patrol guide as reasonable. Um, but not just reasonable, uh, those requirements, it's a very clear, explicit requirement in Local Law 56 that the consent to search guidance must include provisions for utilizing interpretation services. It's not a matter of reasonableness, it's a matter of complying with the law. Um, similarly, the department um, made most of their changes to the patrol guide in Section 212.11, governing investigatory encounters. In that section, they didn't address the fact that the Right to Know Act applied to vehicle searches, home searches. There was one update made to a provision in the patrol guide that dealt with inventory searches of automobiles, um, but that was basically it. Um, they didn't really uh, make any plans to implement the law outside pedestrian encounters, which is something that had they meaningfully engaged with the communities that uh, advocated for this bill, we could have caught much earlier. Um, and one, uh, another area uh, where the patrol guide was lacking that the NYPD didn't address in their earlier testimony was on the exceptions um, uh, related to uh, so-called implied consent searches. Uh, so there's a limited range of searches that happen when entering uh, public facilities. Um, courthouses, et cetera, where your entrance into that location implies your consent to be searched. Neither the identification law nor the consent to search law applies in those cases, but the way that the NYPD incorporated that exception into the patrol guide, it left out the qualifying language about your entrance into that location needing to constitute implied consent to search. So the result is the patrol guide provision that appears to imply a much broader exception to when officers don't have to comply with their requirements. Um, and lastly, I'll, uh, I'll point out that the, well, the NYPD supports uh, Antonio Reynoso, Councilmember Reynoso's bill to codify the reporting on declined searches. We would recommend that the bill uh, also include reporting on language access services so that we can get a sense for whether or not the department is committed to utilizing interpretation services when interacting with people uh, with limited English proficiency. And we would also recommend that the council kind of complete the picture on all types of investigatory encounters by NYPD officers. Um, so there was some discussion earlier about the fact that the NYPD couldn't uh, produce numbers, couldn't give any data to council member questions about how many level two encounters were taking place, how many requests to search specifically at level two encounters versus level three. Um, and the uh, it, it points to a clear need to get a full accounting 
of reporting on uh, all types of investigatory and enforcement counters by the NYPD. So we would recommend uh, legislation to require, similar to the way that the NYPD collects and reports data on stop and frisk, uh, to require the NYPD to track and publicly report information on level one, level two encounters, traffic stops, and really uh, get a sense of how policing impacts New Yorkers. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Can, uh, just one question, and I, and I know s some people left from up there, and I know you, you came up with the, with the uh, scenario, well, not a scenario, but uh, something that happened to the young ladies who went to the train. Do they file C CRB complaints as well or no? What does that um, like? We haven't yet filed any CCRB complaints. It's okay. not that we're not open to it. I think um, we are in the process of trying to get young folks trained up on the Right to Know Act and um, the fact that they're able to ask for a business card. Okay. And I would just urge everybody when these interactions happen to make sure that we file them so that they're documented. It just makes our lives easier to at least attract this stuff. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Um, okay, you Salim, Rising Up Movement, I can't read the handwriting, I think I got this right, Matthew Beeston, MTR, New York, am I saying it right? Oh, Make the Road, oh, sorry, duh. This is rising up. There you go. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Matthew J. Beeston, a student and a youth leader of Make the Road New York, who currently resides in East New York. Last November, I was coming from a movie screening coordinated by a coalition that I'm a partner in. The event was running late, and my bus was and my bus route was delayed. Thus, um, thus, I'm a block away from my house at around 11 p.m. I had a flight to catch the next within the next few hours, and I realized that I didn't have a pair of headphones for it. I decided to go to the corner store that I knew would have a pair I would be able to get at a short notice. It was, la it was late at night, and I just got called by my mom, telling me to hurry up and get home, bef not too long before I got off the bus. So I'm, I'm naturally walking with a haste. However, once I made, however, once I made it to the middle of the block, a black car with tinted windows stopped parallel to me. I didn't notice this until I hear a man, I hear, I hear a man's voice call to me and ask, where was I going? Unsure of who these people are, I practice my right not to answer and I continue moving. Within a few seconds, within a few seconds later, two men burst out of the car and one of them began to beam a flashlight in inches away from my face, bombarding me with questions with, while looking through my bag. While, while the other man was a few distance away from, from me and the man with a flashlight, he was gripping his holster. Eventually, the man with the flashlight was satisfied with my answers, and they got back into their car and drove away. Throughout the situation, I tried to remain silent because I knew that the situation could happen much worse. My choice was confirmed once one of the police officers told me that he believed I was walking quickly because I had a weapon or a gun. The two, the two never informed me that they were police officers. I had to find out th their title by my eye stumbling on their badges in my state of panic. I knew I was supposed to receive a business card with those, with those cops' information, but I did not. I felt dehumanized not only by the actions, but by the fact that th these police officers were, ta were talking at me and not with me. The thing that shook me the most was that the, th was the thought of the t that the two police officers was going to continue patrolling my community for people who look just like me, for, the same, for similar matters. It, w 
it worried me that he could have found someone that would have one ver one variable different about them. Instead of coming from an after school activity, the person could have been coming from a party or a bar. Chance was the only thing preventing someone from being a lost soul. My story is one of many, with young people all over the city with stories just like mine. It shouldn't take a form, any form of humiliation or fear for these issues to be changed. What needs to happen for the N is for the NYPD to comply with the laws the law to prevent anyone from being mistreated. The relationship between NYPD and the community members has a long history made up of unac unaccountability and violence. We have stories consistently being told about people in our communities being brutalized by the police to the point where I'm desensitized and numb from the sight of people that can very well be my brother, my dad, or my family, or my friends being harmed by a cop whether it be viewing this harsh mistreatment of my community members broadcasted on TV, hearing what happened to an individual down the street, to having to go through it myself. Make the Road and coalitions of advocates have fought for the right to know act. This bill is meant to limit police, possible police abuse, help prevent unnecessary police and counters as well as requiring the NYPD to be more transparent when interacting with the public. It was created so that situations like mine wouldn't have the space to happen. That night continues to rear its nasty, he nasty head in my mind. That event could have gone so differently. By simply asking for my consent to search me, giving me some way to adjust my concern to them, and just talking to me as if I was an equal. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing that. Um, my name is Yosan Lim. I'm a co-director of the Justice Committee, but I'm here uh, to read a statement, uh, a testimony on behalf of a member of Desi's Rising Up and Moving Drum, one of our ally organizations in Queens. So his sta uh, Adam's statement is this, my name is Adam and I am a resident of Richmond Hill, Queens, and a member of DRUM, Desi's Rising Up and Moving. DRUM is a membership-led community organization that builds the power of working-class South Asian and Indo-Caribbean immigrant workers, adults, and youth to lead social and policy change in their communities. Through DRUM, I learned about the Right to Know Act and exactly what the law does. In November 2018, on a Saturday evening in Richmond Hill, my brother and my friends were stopped and questioned by the police. We were walking to our apartment when we saw an NYPD car speeding up the wrong way down a one-way block. Uh, when they saw us, they stopped, walked up to us, started asking us questions about a robbery that just happened. After asking questions, they walked away. I believe they violated the ID law for the Right to Know Act. They did not identify which precinct they are from. They did not give us their business card. Since they were questioning us about a, a crime, they were required by law to give us a business card. As an undocumented queer person, I am very nervous around the police. I know many of the LGBTQ plus community have faced harassment and abuse from the NYPD. And because of my immigration status, I worry the police st uh, if the police stop me and it leads to an arrest, I would be put on ICE's radar. And because of my immigration status, I did not report this incident. Um, how can immigrants feel safe on the streets if the NYPD continues to violate laws such as the Right to Know Act? I ask the committee to hold the NYPD accountable when their officers violate the law. Thank you. And then I'm just going to also make a few observations about the NYPD testimony. So I say this as a representative of the Justice Committee. Um, so uh, first thing, when advocates finally got a chance to meet with the NYPD, which was pretty close to when um, Right to Know Act was supposed to be implemented and saw the instruction that was going in the patrol guide, when they sat down and met with us, they said, we're not gonna make any changes. And when we asked them, "Are you gonna make, will you make changes after implementation, they basically um, sidestepped the question, didn't make any promises. So this is actually, even though we've been trying to follow up with them, and when I say we, I mean CPR, um, we've been trying to follow up with them. This is the first time we actually heard the NYPD say that they're willing to deal with the language access issue and deal with some of the other issues around street uh, car stops and home searches that are, that's in the patrol guide. Um, I also want to just 
flag that the way that the NYPD was talking about level one stops, as I think you know, um, is really misleading, that there are many, many times when level one stops absolutely feel hostile, um, where they're asking questions like, who are you, where are you going? That's all happens in level one stops. We also heard an NYPD head here uh, refer to uniform officers as troops on the ground. So it just gives you a little bit of insight into the way that co cops are operating in our communities. And of course, any interactions with police for certain community members are gonna feel hostile. And then the last thing that I wanna point out is that um, the federal monitor pilot on level one and two stops does not um, require that there's ever gonna actually be real reporting on level one and two stops. So it's absolutely essential that the council legislate that there be reporting on level one and two stops. Thank you all for coming out today. And, and Matthew, I want to say that I share your story, young man. Uh, the same interaction happened to me at 13. It was my first interaction with the police department. Um, so keep your head up. I know it gets tough, and you know you never forget that experience. It's something that I still live with uh, today. Um, but one of the, the ways you make changes doing what you did coming here today. So I want to thank you for sharing your story. Also, I want to say if you did not file a CCRB complaint, you should do that as well. Um, I'll also just uh, end on the level one stops. We do have a bill on level one stops that we are going to introduce. We'll be calling on people, I guess, to help us advocate to make sure it passes. Um, and then we're going to look at the twos and threes uh, again as well. Uh, with that being said, I want to thank everyone for coming out to this necessary hearing. And we want the public to know that you have the right to know who's policing your community and who's stopping you. Um, and we're going to do a whole lot more work to make sure we're doing outreach and giving uh, CCRB more tools, but also figuring out some creative ways we can all collectively work together between advocate, advocacy groups and government and everyone else to make sure the public really does know. With that being said, this hearing is now finished.